Welcome everybody to a brand new Blu-ray and DVD out and about video today and come on you thought Saw was dead didn't you? Yes you did but think again with Spiral from the book of Saw hitting store shelves along with season 10 of The Walking Dead, season 3 of Star Trek Discovery and Blue Underground is releasing a 4K edition of the 1981 horror mystery Dead and Buried plus Vestron is releasing a collector's edition Blu-ray of the 1986 action horror experience The Wraith plus much much more. So let's go see the deals, exclusives, and we are the first location, Walmart. So let's go in and see what they got. Film Fan 108. You are a movie lover and a hunter of all things physical media. Your task is to find all of the media released this week. We have not made it easy for you. There is many areas with many empty shelves, mainly here at Walmart. You are obviously not surprised by this. However, your task is not an easy one. There will be a lot of sweat, blood, and tears. And at the end of the day, it might break you. Can you find all the physical media for the release week? Or perish as a disgraceful physical media lover? Live or die, the choice is yours. Oh, I'll play your game, Jigsaw Killer. I'll meet you on your level. You want a physical media battle? You will get a physical media battle, goddammit. Of course, I totally failed here at Walmart. Or should I say, Walmart failed me, goddammit. Okay, Jesus. I mean, the big new release this week, they didn't even have that, for Christ's sake. I mean, how last week, at least they had Mortal Kombat. You could say at least they had the big release of the week, and they had it. Okay, give them credit. Here... Shit, they didn't even have that, man. Damn. I mean, I was hoping for something this week. I mean, considering it is a plentiful physical media week, a lot of stuff did come out. You'd think they'd have at least one goddamn thing. Whew, man. When Walmart fails, well, give them credit. They fail hard. <laughs> Damn it. They really do. But hey, you want to know what they do have, though? Which is honestly really cool. They may not have any physical media, guys, but hey, they do have toys. They have... Ultraman, if you're looking for it. Hey, they have Willy Wonka from the Chocolate Factory, which eerily very much looks like Gene Wilder. Wow. They have, ah, Dracula. They have some Star Trek love. Ooh, Pennywise from It. They have The Exorcist. Hey, Regan. I wonder if this comes with pea soup. <laughs> and then they also have the Phantom of the Opera, which honestly just looks like they dressed up Skeletor in a, in a red robe. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, they have that, but unfortunately, no physical media. Of course, why would they have the one thing that I'm here searching for? But then again, this is Walmart, so always expect the expected. That's for damn sure, guys. <sighs> All right, fair enough. Well, I failed in my task here. Let's hope more physical media. <laughs> Jeez, let's pray. Pray, Lord that there is more physical media on the way. All right, everybody, we are at our second location, Target. But before I go in, I gotta talk to you guys about something as I normally do. And that is none other than a little movie theater, Disney Battle of the Titans, Clag of the Titans, dare I say? Maybe. Let's dive in, shall we? Movie theater owners blame Marvel's Black Widow box office collapse on Disney Plus launch. Hmm. Disney announced in March that Black Widow, among several of its other 2021 films, would premiere simultaneously on the studio's subscription-based streaming service for a premium of $30. Whew, yikes. 
and on the big screen while the struggling movie theater industry regained its footing. On July 9th, Black Widow opened to $80 million in the U.S. and Canada, setting a COVID-era box office record. And Disney also padded the weekend tally by reporting that the comic book adventure collected an additional $60 million worldwide on Disney+, Plus, which pushed it to over $200 million. Congrats on the dead widow. Ten days after its domestic debut, the National Association of Theater Owners released a fiery statement. They say that it underperformed at the box office and that it's Disney's fault. Despite assertions that this pandemic-era improvised release strategy was a success for Disney and the simultaneous release model, it demonstrates that an exclusive theatrical release means more revenue for all stakeholders in every cycle of the movie's life, which basically means that... You did wrong, D Disney. Theatrical, baby. Don't put it on your, on your streaming service. Trust us. We know what we're doing. Maybe. Of course, cin cinema operators have vested interest in preserving some sort of theatrical window. Of course they do, because everyone wants to make money. Now, they did end up saying that many buzzy titles to premiere in the past 18 months, including Wonder Woman 84, GVK, Cruella, were also available concurrently on various streaming services. The two highest grossing movies of the year, A Quiet Place Part 2 and Fast 9, were initially only available to watch at the multiplexes. Very interesting statistic. Hollywood studios and movie theater operators have historically contentious relationship. Of course, they they do it now with the pandemic and the streaming services. Well, that's honestly only gotten worse. Without a hybrid release, NATO predicts that Black Widow would have secured a much larger opening weekend and somewhere north of 92 or 100 million. And while the film soared past the opening weekends of recent releases like Quiet Place 2 and F9, its ticket sales quickly dropped off. In its sophomore outing, Black Widow collected 26 million, a huge 69% decline. Or as NATO put it, a stunning second weekend collapse in theatrical revenue. Of course they do. Now, Disney declined to comment. However, insiders say the company is attempting to reach customers at every comfort level while the world emerges from COVID. It's also worth noting that the pandemic is not over yet. And, and the idea of the Delta variants that are becoming much more of a concern is actually forced Los Angeles, the largest movie-going market in the country, to reinstate its mask mandate, which uh, doesn't help, let's be real. Now, they do end up going on to say that this model is not exactly foolproof, that it doesn't exactly work, the subscription service, and they pretty much end up saying that basically they are essentially screwing themselves over because not all of the profit exactly goes to Disney when it comes to their subscription-based platform because some of it has to go to Roku and Apple TV and of a couple other ones who basically put their subscription service on their platforms so they have to give them a certain amount of revenue which is like 15 percent or something but again for Disney that's a drop in the well so they could really care less but yeah NATO theater owners yeah they're not happy guys and who can really blame them? At the end of the day, really, honestly, who can blame them here? Now, let's be real. Is it entirely Disney's fault? I don't know if it is. I really don't, man. And, and honestly, I'm of two minds of this, if you really think about it. Because, because of this pandemic that has happened... Honestly, a lot of these studios had to do something. Yes, they could have held back these movies for God knows how long and just waited for a theatrical release, but there's no guarantee that that theatrical release was going to be 100% foolproof that they were going to get the money that they wanted. There's not 100% guarantee satisfaction that that was ever going to happen, man. And so they decided, why not get in on this subscription-based service digital platform that a lot of these studios have been wanting to do anyways, but COVID just pushed it along a little further than what was expected. And also, let's be real here, the theatrical experience, even though I love it, has been got, gotten chipped away over the years, slowly but surely, more and more and more. It's gotten more chipped away and less and less effective 
And so studios have tried to find alternatives. And with COVID, this was the perfect opportunity to do so. Now, $30, uh, I don't know if I agree on the $30 part, but I kind of get it. I, I understand it. And you also have to understand that movie theaters don't have a bargaining chip in this in this whole thing. They, they really don't. I mean, they give more of their revenue to Disney because Disney is a huge powerhouse. And so you have to remember that when a movie is at a theater, the theater owners and everything, they split they split the revenue with the studios 50-50. And as I said, Disney gets a little bit more piece of the pie because of how much of a powerhouse they are. Is that fair? Maybe not, but it is what it is at this point. And so, you know, Disney is thinking to themselves, okay, maybe it's not 100% effective, this whole thing with the COVID and, and movie theaters, so why not get in on our own streaming service? Yeah, we have to give a little bit to Roku and whatnot, but again, who really cares, man? Because, again, it's a small drop in the well for, for, for them. They're still making a bunch of money on the front end and the back end. They're cool with it. They really have no problem with it. And also... Look, Disney's not the only one in this game. Like, Warner Brothers is, and Paramount... I mean, Paramount gives a lot of stuff over over to Netflix. They've been doing that for a while. You look at Warner Brothers with, eight, with HBO Max. They're doing a lot of exclusive, same day, on their platform, and the theatrical as well. And, look, it's worked out well for them. I mean, they're getting a lot of subscribers on HBO Max, and it looks like they're doing pretty well for themselves. Now, what happens in 2022? Because they say that once 2022 comes, all of those movies, same day, theatrical, and, and on their service, that's no longer going to happen. It's just going to be in theaters. But what about when they're losing all of these subscribers, and they're losing the subscriptions, and they're losing the revenue to HBO Max because they've gotten rid of that thing that everyone's gotten used to? What happens then? I guarantee you they will come back and do it. They say no now, but when they start losing money, like I said, money talks, bullshit walks, and they will do it eventually. They'll get back to doing it, I swear. Look, at the end of the day, studios were going to try this model, and it, it is what it is, man. It's not perfect. There is no 100% perfect storm that's going to get us to this point. There, there, there is none. There's just no way. And with COVID being more of a past, I mean, yes, it's better than what it was six months months ago or even a year ago, but it's still nagging around. And consumer confidence is not 100% there yet. It's We're slowly getting back to things, but it's just not. And so, you know, yeah, movie theaters can complain about this and that, but they just don't have the bargaining chips like they used to. And now Disney and a lot of these other studios have more of an incentive. And they're like, hey, we could make the revenue on our streaming sites. Yeah, we're not going to get as much as maybe we should or maybe that we'd like to. But we're still going to get a lot of it. And you can either get a little piece of the pie while, while you can or we're taking it all. Is it fair? No, not not really. But at this point, COVID has exposed so many things so many weaknesses of certain industries that studios are just taking advantage of it, man. They're just going to continue to to do that. I mean, two hundred million is nothing to sneeze at. And would it have been better just in the theaters alone? Well, you never know. You don't know that. It's it's all a gamble. You don't know whether it was going to be successful in that way or whether it was just going to be a bust. Disney decided to do what they do, and you're either going to go along with the program or you're not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, we're all bowing down to the Disney overlords anyway, so it might as well be the movie theaters, right? <sighs> Maybe. I don't know. You let me know what you think of that one, guys. I'm dying to know. In the meantime, well, there is a decent release week here, not saying we saw anything at Walmart because we saw a diddly shed, but maybe we might see something over at Target? God, I hope so. <laughs> the only way to find out is to go inside, so let's head in and check it out. All right, everybody, we are in at Target, and look, a little bit of new release love. I mean, compared to what we saw over at Walmart, <laughs> hey, I'll take it. Let's dive in, shall we, with the first thing I'm seeing, and that is none other than the Blu-ray DVD digital of Spiral from the book. 
of Saw for $22.99, the DVD for $16.99. Now, I got a chance to see this in the movie theaters with John. Now, John is a casual Saw fan. I am a die-hard Saw fan. I love all of the Saw movies. Well, there is an exception or two. I mean, Saw the final chapter is not exactly the best damn thing in the franchise. Uh, not, not so much, guys. But for the most part, I love pretty much all of them to varying de degrees. But I really appreciate all of the Saw movies in one way or another. And I know that a lot of people hate on them. They call them torture porn to ch try to degrade the movies. But I think they're much better than some of the labels that they've been given over the years. I like the character development. I like the mythology, the blood, the gore, the traps. It's incredibly creative and very fascinating. Sort of inside the mind of a killer and the justifications of doing that. I, I think it's really well done. I think a lot of the movies are, man. And I remember when that last movie came out, Jigsaw, and it wasn't really very loved, and a lot of people really didn't go see the movie. I think at that point, the franchise was kind of tired. I think a lot of people were kind of just like over the Saw franchise at that point and were ready to move on, so they kind of did. And they let it settle for a long while, let it simmer a bit, and then... Chris Rock said, hey, I've got an idea for a new Saw movie. I'm a fan. Why not? And everyone's like, Chris Rock equals a Saw movie with Samuel Jackson? Whoa, what is that going to be like? So I, everybody was kind of intrigued by it and wanted to check it out. And sort of the popularity of Saw is back yet again. But is the movie worth it? Now, basically what the movie is is this person who is basically a copycat jigsaw killer is on the loose yet again but instead of targeting normal everyday people well they are targeting cops yes of course they are and they are just continuing to to target these people why are they targeting them exactly are they targeting them for specific reasons is it just a random thing nobody really exactly knows until it's all revealed in the end of dun 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 that that whole big montage sequence oh my god it was this person all along yeah you know how saw does it man now I gotta admit, I was looking forward to this movie. I was. I really was. Again, being as big of a Saw fan as I am, I was wanting to dive into it. I really was. I was looking forward to it. Did it meet the expectations? And honestly, I'm gonna be real with you guys, and it did not meet the expectations. It didn't. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I mean, I had half and half expectations. I mean, I knew it wasn't going to be like a lot of the earlier Saw movies. Of course it wasn't. But I was expecting something that resembled the Saw experience that I loved and remembered. Put it that way. And it didn't really. I mean, the problem is, is that they're going after a copycat killer, but... At the same time, you're watching a copycat movie. It's not really a Saw sequel in the traditional sense. And I don't even think it's a really great Saw movie, even in the copycat sense. The problem with this movie is it kind of feels like they're... I guess to say, it kind of feels like they're trying to remember what it's like to make a Saw movie, but they can't quite remember how to do it. And there's just a lot of things here that I feel are just kind of a lame attempt at making a Saw film, whether it's the blood and the gore, which is cool, but it's not as cool as other Saw movies, or even the traps. The traps are kind of cool and interesting, but yet they're not as original or as creative or unique as what you had seen before. I mean, even the characters, the characters feel very undeveloped and underutilized, and at the end of the movie, when there's this big revelation that goes on, you're kind of like, huh? 
really? Like, you're just like, they get that? Okay, and you and I, I know they're not going to reveal everything in this movie. They're saving you for, for sequelitis territory. However, you're just really like, that kind of doesn't make any sense. And why wouldn't they have figured that out earlier? Like, there's a lot of plot holes here. There's a lot of moments where you're scratching your head, like, really, are the characters that dumb? I mean, they have to dumb down characters in order to actually make a better plot. I mean, there's, there's so much things here that's, that's wrong with this movie. And it just feels like, it just feels like a movie that is trying to ape off of Saw, is trying to ape off of the better Saw movies. And oh, do you remember the Saw franchise? Well, if you do, and if you love Chris Rock, Saw and them combined, come on now, you're going to love this. And it's kind of like, they're trying to get Saw lovers to really like this movie, but it just feels like it's just just all going through the motions and it doesn't really feel like they're doing anything really concrete or really spectacular with the Saw franchise it just kind of feels like they just did it as a cash grab right because it's a franchise it's a new idea and so why not try to cash in on people's nostalgia of the Saw films that's what it feels like at the end of the day man I mean even great actors like Samuel Jackson or Chris Rock which are usually solid they're not that good here they're they're really not I mean Samuel Jackson is barely utilized and when he is you're like that's not Sam Jackson that I remember even Chris Rock Chris Rock comes off as kind of lame i mean the comedy does isn't really all that good honestly i mean and why you try to put in forced comedy in a saw movie i mean i know you got chris rock and i know they want to do that but it doesn't work it just feels forced and it just feels bland and lifeless and they're trying to shoe in things into a saw movie that they shouldn't be i mean there are some good moments here there's there's moments in the film where it almost reminds you of those old school saw days and man do i miss those old school days being in the theater and seeing a, a great saw sequel man damn do i miss it if it's halloween it must be Saw. I mean, come on. Those were the old school days. Those were great, and I love them. But do I get excited by a Saw spinoff? Because it really is. There's not much of a connection to the other Saw films outside of a passing reference to Jigsaw and the killings and John Kramer. That's about it. There's really nothing that's hanging this movie on to a thread of a Saw sequel like Jigsaw did. And by the way, we're never going to get another sequel to Jigsaw, or at least I don't think we're ever going to. I mean, there were so many loose plot threads and things I was so intrigued about in that Jigsaw movie that may never come to pass, may never actually happen. I mean, they kind of tease, well, if this is successful, we might get another Saw movie, an official Saw sequel. But you know, they're they're just giving you false hope at this point they'll make another spiral movie before they ever make another official saw sequel come on you guys know that i mean i gotta tell you they got me i mean i went into the movie theater excited because i wanted another saw experience i wanted that i desperately did and i went into this really wanting to like it but at the end of the day I hate to say it, but this movie ends up being a real disappointment to me in so many ways. And it just feels like Saw light. It feels like they're trying to figure out what a Saw film is instead of actually being a Saw film. And at the end of the day, do I really want a copycat Saw film when I can just watch a real Saw film? With this film, I'll... I kind of wish it got killed by the trap. Ah, The Walking Dead, the complete 10th season, DVD for $44.99. Oh, The Walking Dead. Hmm, how I miss thee. <laughs> Indeed, I do. Sometimes I actually do miss it, man. And what I mean by that is I used to be an old school fan of The Walking Dead. If we're talking about the TV series, I was an old school fan and I was there at the very beginning when the pilot aired 
way, way long ago, man. I absolutely was. And I enjoyed the series. I did. I, I enjoyed the first five, six-ish seasons, a little bit more. I enjoyed it. I loved Rick, and I, I loved the crew, and I loved the post-apocalyptic setting, and I thought the zombie designs were really great, and there were a lot of things I really dug about the, the show, and a lot of cool characters, and and the deaths, and, and some cool zombie kills. There was a lot to really love about The Walking Dead. There really was. And... I had sort of seen the writing on the wall, or at least I kind of thought I did, because towards the end of season six, they were hyping up this character of Negan, right? Negan, big bad motherfucker, Negan, who is he? You know, who, who, big bad that we're going to have to contend with next. And my favorite villain in The Walking Dead was the governor. I loved that whole storyline with the governor and and our fights with him I thought it was amazing and so I went in thinking he was going to be another one of those like governor badass guys and then when the beginning of season 7 hit and that episode no you know that episode I'm talking about man the the one where those two main characters man they man Lucio went to town on those fuckers my god man they got beat to shit like a bloody pulp, like literally a pool of blood. And I was like, oh, holy shit. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. And the problem after that, to me, was everything after that opening episode of season seven, it kind of felt flat. I wasn't as convinced on Negan as I was at the beginning of the season. And by the end of season seven, I was just... I wasn't as much of a fan of Negan as I thought I was going to be. He wasn't as badass as the governor. And, and I felt like they had kind of maybe missed an opportunity. He was still good. The acting was good. It just didn't quite get me the way I wanted it to. At the same time, I was watching season 8. And season 8 is not terrible, but... I thought they made a lot of missteps with the characters and killed off people that they shouldn't have. And I thought it continued the weak streak that had happened in Season 7. And so that was a problem for me. That was a big pro a problem. On top of that, it was really no longer becoming a zombie show in a lot of ways. I mean, the zombies had taken a backseat to a more traditional post-apocalyptic, we're fighting one another type of show. And that had kind of lost my interest in, in a lot of ways. It really did. So somewhere in the early season eight, I had, I had cut loose. I had cut ties and I was gone. I, I wasn't sticking around. I mean, I remembered the good days of The Walking Dead and what it was now wasn't really what I remembered. So I, I cut and run, put it that way, man. I, I did. And then everybody started to say, around somewhere season nine they're like wow it's kind of getting a little bit better it's not as bad and then everyone was like wow season 10 is pretty good too and i've been hearing rumblings of the walking dead is coming back it's 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 rising from the dead the undead so to speak i mean it was and that's good to see man it really is I did look at some, you know, recaps and reviews of season 10, and some of it is really interesting. Things like the whispers and people pretending to, to be zombies and this sort of turf war that is happening and how it's set in, in the future and, you know, uh, survivors many, many years into this whole apocalypse and apocalyptic tale and how some characters have changed like Negan has completely turned from what we had seen of him at the beginning of season seven to a very different interesting and very complex character and just a lot of the alliances and the mistrust there, there's a lot of things going on in season 10 
actually there's been a lot of stuff going on i mean they, i mean they always complicated every single season but season 10 feels like way of a complication man but i heard that it is an improvement and it really is and i gotta give them credit for that man i really do look I always rooted for The Walking Dead. I I really did, man. In those er, early seasons, I still loved. I loved the drama. I loved the character interactions. I loved the zombies. There was so much about The Walking Dead that I loved. And yet at the same time, I saw it going down the rabbit hole of... of lesser than what it used to be. And... It's nice to see it coming back in a big bad way. It's nice to see that there's still intrigue here and people are excited about what's coming up for the show. I do. And look, it's cool to see some of these characters still sticking around, like Daryl and and Carol. I mean, I remember the old school days with, like, Carol, who was this meek, scared woman, and now she's a complete badass. I mean, what a great characterization that is, man. And Daryl, how far he's come, and even somebody like a Negan or Maggie, or Michonne. The Walking Dead has always morphed every single season. It's never tried to be the same thing. It's always tried to one-up itself and always change the narrative, and I appreciate that. Sometimes to really great results, and other times to lesser standards than what you were used to. I'm glad it's still going strong, and I'm glad that season 10 sort of upped the ante and is better than what people remember from not so long ago, but at the same time, should I revisit The Walking Dead? And I I think I may do that when the series is all over. When the series is all over and I can go on Netflix or I can go on, you know, another streaming site and watch it all together, maybe then I will. Maybe then I might give it a little bit more of a chance. But until then, you know, I stopped somewhere towards the beginning of season eight and... It was no longer really intriguing me. And when I heard about certain character deaths like like Carl, I was like, man, you really missed an amazing opportunity to keep a character around and develop it. And they just didn't. And then getting rid rid of Rick, even though we're getting like two or three spinoff movies with Rick, when the hell are we going to get those goddamn things? But we're getting those at some point. I mean... The Walking Dead is really never going to die. There's going to be spin-off movies and other spin-off TV series. But I'm glad that they finally decided to set an end date and call it quits and be done with it. Sometimes a series goes on for way too long, past its expiration date. And at times, The Walking Dead has definitely felt that way. I'm glad that there's a revitalization of it. I'm glad that there's a lot of intrigue with these evil characters and a lot more of you know a badass turf war and you can do a little bit more with it but i sort of yearn for the old school walking dead days i i really do man and maybe you get those feels here guess i'll just have to wait and see but definitely let me know what you guys think think about that though I'll always love The Walking Dead, the early stuff, and maybe one day, again, there will be a revisit, but until that day, I'm just going to have to remember the old the old school days of uh, the governor and the Rick and prison and all that other great stuff. <sighs> Let's hope they, they get back to old school Walking Dead and not the new school stuff, because that didn't really intrigue me as much. Just saying, guys. Definitely let me know. But in the meantime, well, there's only a couple of new releases here. But again, hey, that's better than what we had gotten. So I'll take it. Let's head out. Woo! Damn, we actually got some physical media love here at Target, man. Jeez. About time, wouldn't you say, guys? Yeah, I definitely would say. Man, oh man. I mean... Not as much as I would have liked. I mean, let's be real. They could have had a little bit more, but compared to what we did have, we was pretty much nothing. Yeah, I'll take what I can get here, man. And I'm just happy for a good-sized physical media week because it does mean Target will have something. And they had the big-name release. They also had little 
Walking Dead zombie love, which, come on, who can really deny? So they had something this week, man. And compared to Mother's Hubbard's empty cupboard at Walmart, man, this is a pleasant surprise. It's <laughs> pretty damn sure. I was like, oh no, Target is going to be like Walmart. This is going to be so bad. And I'm so happy it is not, man. Good Lord. Whew. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> this is for damn sure, man. Hey, a little bit of physical media love definitely goes a long way. And yeah, it could have been a little bit more, but uh, compared to Walmart, <laughs> shit, I'll take it. <laughs> that is for a damn sure, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Just a little bit of physical media love. But hey, <laughs> compared to where we were, this is a blessing <laughs> for damn sure, man. So how about we go to the next location? Hopefully, well, let's hope and pray for more physical media love. Now, hold up a second, guys. Hold up just a little bit there because before we go on to the next physical media location, I do want to check out a place I haven't been to in just a little bit of time. There have been rumblings and rumors that there is packages waiting for me. So, well, you know what that means. When they say there's packages, I come a running. And that is none other than the post office, baby. Oh, I love the post office. Any packages from you guys, I have to get here as fast as I can. And you guys always make it worth it. The amazing stuff that I have gotten of late has been fantastic. And let's hope the streak continues if there is packages at the P.O. Box waiting for me. Can't wait to find out. Well, the P.O. Box has been opened, and did I get any packages as perhaps promised? Well, yeah, I actually did, guys. I got one, and I got two. eBay and Declutter. Very, very nice. A little bit more subscriber P.O. Box love. A little bit goes a long way, and when it comes from you guys... It's some of the best. Let's get back to the car. And how about we unbox some packages? All right, back from the post office into the car with the physical media packages, baby. Oh, I am dying to find out what is in these, man. Haven't had it in a little bit, some subscriber love, so sounds about right to get back in, in into it man and from you guys some of the best seriously you guys have been have been killing it with the stuff that you've been sending me it has been amazing so how about we dive in man and let's start with the first package man from declutter all the way in georgia baby oh man let's see what they got me in good old georgia huh and that is Oh, I have never heard of this movie. Whoa, this is interesting. Wow. Journey to the End of the Night. Look at that. Whoa, with Brendan Fraser, Scott Glenn, Mo's Death, where life is cheap, hope is priceless oh wow i have never heard of this and i am a brendan fraser fan by by the way i have never heard of this man holy cow wow nice this is interesting and it's a it's a foreign release too huh during to the end of the night is a gritty crime thriller illicit transaction gone right two americans in exile have been carving out a living in Brazil wearing a nightclub brothel. But they have both harbored dreams of getting out of the business once and for all. Also, one person. Whoa! Seriously! Holy shit, man. No, I have... Damn, I've never heard of this thing. I haven't. But I love Brendan Fraser. And anything, like, new and unique that I've never heard of from Brendan Fraser, I, I love to dive into, man. And I love Scott Glenn. Man, Scott Glenn's so good of an actor. Yo, a gritty crime thriller. This looks cool. Holy shit, yeah, from a, from the UK. 
Dude, I don't never heard of this thing. I don't even know if this thing even has a Blu-ray release. Just like a, a straight up DVD one, but that is freaking cool, man. Look at that. That is awesome. Holy shit. Some unknown Brendan Fraser gem. That is awesome, man. I don't know who sent me this from Declutter, but dude, thank you. This is amazing. This is awesome. Some Brendan Fraser love, man. Gritty crime thriller action. That is cool. Holy shit. That that's that's pretty awesome. I was not expecting that. That is cool, man. That is awesome. Damn, I, I gotta dive into that one soon. <laughs> shit. And then we got stuff through eBay here, man. Very interesting. I, I wonder what is in this eBay package. Let's 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 see about this, man. Let's see. Let's 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 dive in. Man, if it's as good as like your journey to the end of the night, like that's awesome. Man, and I, and I love Brian Brendan Fraser too. Shit. Let's see what is this? What is in here, man? Ugh, taking a little bit more effort to open this uh, this thing up, but we're gonna do it, man. Yo, they, they, they package this thing good. What is in in here? Oh, okay. What is this? Boy, this thing is like wrapped to death, man. Woo! They definitely protected it. That's for damn sure. Whoa, that's cool. Yo, I haven't seen this one in forever. Oh, this is a, this is a good one, guys. And that is the Blu-ray of Mulholland Falls. Oh, look at that, that is cool. Holy shit, Melanie Griffiths, Chas Palminteri, Michael Masson, Chris Penn, Treat William, Jennifer Connelly, Andrew McCarthy, John Malkovich, Nick motherfucking Nolte. Damn, what a cast, man. And from Kino Lorber, too. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, this is cool. 1950s Los Angeles. A four detectives who play there by their own rules, dealing with criminals the only way they know how. With deadly force. Oh, man. God damn. I haven't seen this one in forever. Dude, it's been a long time since I've seen Mulholland Falls, man. But I, I, I remember it being really great, man. This is an old school film, man. 1996. Woo! And it takes me back to, to the good old 90s, man. Damn. Oh, this this is great. Dude, I never thought I'd see, a, see, see this going into the collection. But, hey, consider me a happy camper, man. I don't know who sent this my way. But uh, please let me know. Thank you. I mean, seriously. This is awesome, man. I, I love Kino Lorber. I've been getting a lot of Kino Lorber love from you guys. And this is yet another one to add to the collection. Mulholland Falls, man. Oh, so cool. The cast here is amazing. I, I, I remember this being a really, really great sort of, of old school detective crime movie. I remember really loving this back in the day. It's been like decades since I've seen this movie. This definitely deserves a revisit. That's for damn sure, and it's gonna get one. No doubt on that one, man. Wow, look at this. Oh, look at this. Journey to the End of the Night and Mulholland Falls. That is really cool, man. Look at that. That is awesome. That is really fantastic, man. Two movies that are not in the collection. One old school 90s nostalgia that I haven't seen in a long time, and another one, one of those old school Brendan Fraser gems, man, from back in the day. Damn, you gotta love that. Dude, this is awesome. This is fantastic. It's absolutely amazing, and you guys are be beyond the greatest. I mean, dead serious, you guys are amazing, awesome. Two great titles I'm adding to the collection because of you guys. Thank you, beyond worse. Thank you so, so, so much. This is great. Oh my God, I can't wait to dive into both, man. I, I really can, man. And you guys... Wow, you guys are hitting it out of the park with the stuff that you are sending me, man. Stuff that I haven't seen in a long time. Stuff I've never heard of. Man, you guys have been rocking it. Absolutely amazing. And I can't thank you enough, dude. I mean, I've always said it. You don't have to send me stuff. It's not expected, but it is extremely appreciated by far, man. You know, I set up this P.O. box for 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 you guys uh, all the p.o box is is for you guys and you know you guys have said to me hey we're thinking of sending you stuff where to where to send it and 
I decided to pull the trigger on the P.O. Box and you guys have done nothing but do amazing things and send me stuff that is is just out of this world and you continue to do it man this is amazing this is awesome and i can't thank you guys enough if you do want to send the channel any love care packages posters physical media you name it you can it is in the description below Oh man, the P.O. Box has been amazing and you guys have made it a huge resounding success and I can't thank you guys enough. This is absolutely phenomenal and I cannot wait for what you guys send me next. I'm like a, I'm like a little kid at Christmas or what am I talking about? A little kid at Hanukkah, man. You guys are, are fantastic, amazing, and you continue to surprise me, and the surprises are just incredibly well worth it. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Guys absolutely fantastic amazing can't wait to see where the p.o box adventures take me next but in the meantime well we do have more physical media to check out so let's keep the physical media train rolling all right everybody we are at our third location the second walmart i'm gonna go in and check out if there's any interesting indie titles worth checking out if i do i'll bring it back to film fan 108 hq and bring it back to each and every one of you now before i do that i gotta talk about the movie trailer with you guys and since we are talking about spiral and the saw franchise this week well you can't really talk about that until you talk about the man himself the man the myth the legend who put it all together and that is none other than james wan and he just so happens to have a trailer out of a new movie that's coming this year malignant yes the trailer dropped and I got a chance to watch it, and baby, oh baby, what a very interesting trailer this one is. Now, let me talk a little bit about James Wan for a second, because you got to appreciate this guy. How many horror directors out there can really say that they've created multiple iconic horror movies that have spawned long-lasting franchises. You really can. If, if you think about it, you might only be able to count it on one hand. Wes Craven, Sean Cunningham, Toby Hooper, and maybe Sam Raimi and a couple other people there. James Wan is one of them. He really is. And he has become one of the best name horror directors in the genre as we speak. He really has, man. I mean, whether we're talking about Saw or The Conjuring, Insidious, and many, many others that he has done, man. He really has done tremendous stuff for the horror genre. And he's going to do it yet again, or at least try to, with Malignant. Now, basically what this movie is, is it's about this woman played by Annabelle Wallace and she has or had an imaginary friend and this imaginary friend is now getting back into her life and it's very destructive and evil and uh, is ready to terrorize and kill people and she's got to figure out a way to stop this and figure out what this entity or whatever it is attached to her is before it can harm or hurt anybody else and i gotta say the trailer looks great man it looks creepy it looks atmospheric it looks scary as f i mean it really does man and this is james wan's speciality to be fair man i mean it looks like he's taken elements from other creepy you know, atmospheric entity movies like The Entity, the old school one with Bar Barbara Hershey. Very good one, man. A movie like that, or even even moments where it seems like he's kind of aping off of himself. Like moments in the trailer where I'm like, okay, this looks kind of like Conjuring or Insidious in, in, in a way. Just slightly turned differently than it normally would be. But then again, if you're going to ape off of anybody... Hell, might as well wipe off of yourself. I mean, what the hell, man? I mean, it, it looks good. It looks really, really great. And I, I got to give him a lot of credit here because it could come off a little chintzy. It couldn't come off a little 
laughable at times, but the trailer comes off as saying, hey man, this is not Drop Dead Fred, okay? This ain't Drop Dead Fred, okay? Fred now never fucked up people like this, okay? Fuck, man. No, he ain't your friend. He's your fucking enemy. He's gonna fuck you up, man. And I like that. Basically saying, you know, look, this is not for laughs. This is, this is gonna terrorize the hell out of you. And it looks great, man. Now, I'm sure everything's gonna be great here. The acting as well. And I do like Annabelle Wallace. She doesn't exactly have the greatest track record. I mean, she was in Annabelle. Okay, not the greatest. Oh, she was in The Mummy. The Tom Cruise Mummy. Damn. <laughs> yeah, not not good, man, not good. She, she, she hasn't been in the greatest movies, to be fair. But, hell, if you're going to elevate your, your game, if you're going to elevate your, your acting level, the good movies you're in, man, team up with James Wan, man. He, he's got it covered, dude. I mean, James Wan is trying to branch out to other things, obviously doing Aquaman, and he did uh, Fast and Furious 7, and I mean, he, he's tried to, to do different things, but like any good genre lover, he always comes back to the genre he loves, and that's horror, and he he's comfortable in this genre, he really is, and he really has transformed horror in a really great way. Just like a lot of those iconic people before him, the Cravens and the Hoopers, obviously, you know, the Raimis and many, many others, he he has really transformed it in a way that that takes it to the next level to where the genre is, but yet still is able to respect and pay homage to the classics. And he's done a great job at that. And I think this is too. I like this this entity that looks almost humanoid-ish like, but very much like a, a shadow that's attacking these people. I'm just hoping for really effective scares, nothing like cheapo jump scare like, and creepy and gets under your skin. If he can do that, then this movie's gonna be a success. And James Wan has pulled it off before, so let's see if he can do it again. I'm hoping it's gonna be good. I got faith in my man James. What do you guys think, though? Definitely let me know. And in the meantime, well, there's been a little bit of media. Not a ton of it. Maybe more at the second Walmart? Let's hope. Let's give it a go. Back in at the second Walmart, ladies and gentlemen, and it's been a little tough to find the physical media love this week. Just a tad bit tough. However, that doesn't mean that we can't still get some good physical media love, surprising indie love, when all is said and done, when there is literally not much to show off. The second Walmart comes through time and time again, and it does it yet again, guys. More indie love? Yes, please. And quite a few very unique and interesting and bizarro titles out there to check out. That is for damn sure, guys. So you know what that means. I mean, that means that we are heading back to Film Fan 108Q, and that means that you, Seth, oh, yes, you have to show off all that physical media love. You ready? Ah, God! Jeez, don't scare me like that! Ah. So, did I really scare you? Yeah, you, you did! Good. Do you want to play a game? Oh yeah, I want to play a game. You show off that physical media, or I got one hell of a fist that's ready to play with your head. Oh, fine, fine, if you say so, but I got him good, didn't I, guys? <laughs> oh, let's play a game. Yes, let's play a game indeed. <laughs> Yeah, oh boy, I, I love this shit. <laughs> oh boy, do I love this shit indeed, man. Just as I love physical media, that's for damn sure, guys. Now look, it's been a little bit of rough waters. 
dare I say, man. I mean, it really has. Look, was I expecting there to be zippity doo da not a nothing at all at the first Walmart? No, I was at least hoping for the one big release that pretty much everybody should have. But this is Walmart, and, well, easier said than done. However, we did see a little bit of love at Target, so we're starting off in the right path. And truth be told, I thought we weren't going to see anything over at the second Walmart. I thought, oh, man, what a minefield. This is going to be of nothing. However, well... When it comes to physical media, and the second Walmart, always expect some surprises. Walmart indie goodness is back yet again, baby. And I anticipate it every single damn time. Absolutely I do, baby. And, well, this selection looks quite intriguing. How about we dive in, shall we? With the first title, and that is none other than The Blackout experiment. Follow the rules for a chance to live. Hmm. Sounds eerily similar to another horror franchise we're talking about this week, guys. Huh. Eerily similar. Ooh, I, I like that. Blood-stained walls. Some creepy chick on a Weird old television? <laughs> sure, wh why not? The hell? Oh my god, there's blood all over me! <laughs> oh, what is this about? An inhumane doctor forces six strangers to participate in a grisly experiment where they must take the life of another captive in order to save the life of a loved one. Will they play by the doctor's rules or band together against her? Ooh... Come on, you you know what this is aping off of. I mean, seriously. Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. Dun 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 Follow the rules for a chance to live, and obviously forcing people to participate in a grisly experiment to take the life of another captor in order to save a life of a loved one. Boy, we've seen that a time or two in the Saw franchise, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Yeah, this is one of those cheapo ripoffs, ain't it? It kind of feels that way, ain't gonna lie, man. I mean, I like that it's sort of like an evil doctor doing these. And sort of like forcing people to to choose, you know, one life for another. I, I like that idea. And that's one of the reasons why I think I love the Saw franchise as much as I did. Because it's not always black and white. There's a lot of gray areas to that. And the idea of saying, oh, I'm going to save this person. But in order to do that, I have to kill this person. And... This person could have a loving wife or children, somebody who's going to miss them, and you don't know, but you have to sacrifice that person. And those decisions are not as easy as you might think it is, especially when you're put in a life or death situation like that. I always found that stuff really intriguing, man, and Saul was one of the best that, that did it. And then you have all of the copycats, and there is a shitload of them, guys. I mean, especially when Saw came out and was really popular, you saw them all the time, man. Always some sort of Saw ripoff that came and went, man. I mean, even recently, stuff like Escape Room, which is kind of, in some ways, a Saw ripoff, but I think they did pretty well with that, all things considered. Then again, some do it better than others. Uh, the Blackout Experiment, it's an interesting idea, been done to death, but hey, with an inhumane doctor. Well, as long as it's not Dr. Kevorkian, I'm okay with it. Sure, Huntress! Oh, <laughs> oh man. Oh, a beautiful babe versus a killer shark. Gee, I, I wonder who's gonna win. Honey, you got a great ass, but that shark... 
man, he is is ready to eat that ass. Oh man, yeah, and, and not the way you think. <laughs> oh Lord, she wants revenge. It wants blood. Oh, nice. Look at that. Great cover, by the way. That is an awesome cover. Truly, that's that's pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie, man. That's awesome. Oh, what is this about, man? Sheila, an environmentalist venturing into the deep sea to capitalize on the billion-dollar plastic industry, encounters deadly enhanced sharks. She wants revenge. It wants blood. Oh, look at that. And hey, they even have Gandalf in here. Nice. <laughs> oh, shit, man. God damn it. Honey, you ain't no Jason Statham. That, that, that's for damn sure. Oh, man. Shark movies, shark movies, shark movies. Oh, man. I mean, there is a lot of great ones out there. I mean, obviously, The Shadows is pretty good. And, you know, of course, you have some other really great ones out there. Open Water is, is really good as well. Of course, come on. You got to be real. The granddaddy of them all, the best of them all, clearly is... Jaws. Yes, of course it is. Jaws is amazing. It is awesome. And really, it is still to this day the best shark movie there ever will be. Let's be entirely real, man. I mean, yeah, Jaws 2 is really cool. Jaws 3, it ain't half bad. Anything after that, whew. Yeah, but Jaws is still amazing. However, there is one other one that I have in the collection that I really love. And that is... House Shark, yes. Oh, oh God. Oh, jeez. Clean up on aisle 12. Uh, I really do like House Shark, man. I really do. Is it cheesy as shit? Absolutely, man. It is weird, bizarre, uh, cheesy as shit, but I tend to actually enjoy it. I do like a ridiculous shark movie every now and again, and House Shark kind of fits the bill. I do enjoy it, man. All things considered, it is pretty good, man. I mean, there is uh, some other really good ones out there. I mean, obviously, come on, one of the better ones is... Come on, Deep Blue Sea. Deep Blue Sea is awesome, man, and the idea of, like... Uh, a deadly enhanced shark like that immediately brings me to the deep blue sea which is all kinds of awesome i mean that samuel jackson that is great still is really cool to this day man and you got ll cool j as the cook man i mean come on that's pretty good man i mean that's pretty cool i mean i do like some shark stuff and you know i i like a good survival tale uh, this this chick becomes badass, takes on this shark. I mean, it's it's kind of unrealistic because let's be uh, be real, this chick ain't got a chance in hell. However, you know, it is cool to kind of see, you know, this female badass taking on this shark. There, there's something about it that is so instantly cool, man. Can't say the movie might be all that good. I mean, hey, at, at least it at le least it has like you know. Dumbledore in it. <laughs> At least it does. So there's something to be said about that. But uh, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a lot of really decent shark movies, and then there's a lot of crap shark movies. You guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, Sharknado. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, track record ain't, ain't so hot for shark movies a lot of times. But when there's a really good one, there is a really fantastic one. Could Shark Hunters be one of those really great unknown shark gems? Maybe. As long as it's not Sharknado, fine, I'll take it. Alfred. Ooh, look at this. Your mind is his playground. Oh, boy. Uh, killer Doll. Almost looks that way. Ooh. Well, let's just... Put it this way, he's he's not making tea time with you. He's making bloody murder. Oh, indeed he is. Look at that. Oh, that, that, that's kind of a cool cover, man. I kind of like that. Not bad, man. Oh, that's creepy. Look at that. Man, if that was in front of me, I'd piss my fucking pants. <laughs> oh, I'd be like, oh no. I've got more to live for. I still gotta pick up a lot of out-of-print Blu-rays. 
Don't kill me, damn it. <laughs> Brendan Cobb, the famous novelist, is sent to a remote cottage in rural England to find inspiration for his next novel. He believes he found his next subject when he encounters Alfred, a child-sized doll who can come to life. But deadly consequences arise when Brendan realizes Alfred has an intent to kill. Well, I mean, he's got a, got a hammer in his hand ready to hit somebody. What do you think his intentions are, bitch? <laughs> I mean, seriously, man. But he's not freaked out by this? I mean, seriously, like a child-sized doll who can come to life. Yeah, because, you know, we encounter that shit every day. I mean, if he's not on weed, shit, I'd start. <laughs> Fuck, man. You kidding me? Like, like man, I I need to get heavily fucked up in it in order to, to start imagining this shit. Like, woo, god damn, man. I mean, I kind of like this idea of this novelist who sees this child-sized doll come to life and... What does he do with that knowledge? How does he even deal with this? And the idea that this doll comes to life to kill, like, is this all imaginary? Is it in his head? Jesus, is, is this thing actually really out for to fucking kill? Jeez, man, I've I've heard of, like, creepy Cabbage Patch dolls, but never child-sized dolls come to life ready to kill somebody. Well... Let's be real. Cabbage Patch dolls are pretty creepy, so if they were to kill, I I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but oh man, look at that! And to be real, he he probably is trying to kill me because look at his haircut, man. I mean, it, it's a terrible haircut. I mean, if I was that doll, I, I'd probably be be pissed off at at the barber that gave me that one, man. God damn it! Uh, I don't know. I mean, there is some cool killer dolls out there. Let me let's be real, man, Chucky. Chucky's great. I've always said Chucky's really cool. I love dolls. Dolls is awesome. Great. They walk. They talk. They kill. Creepy, atmospheric, and just little wee wee dolls that that stab you to death. There's something creepy and yet kind of weird and kooky about it that I really do enjoy. Love that one. Of course, you gotta say... Dolly, dearest, you do, because that is one crazy killer bitch doll. <laughs> that really is, man. Holy Lord. There are some ones out there, and yes, of course, I gotta say Annabelle, too, because, yeah, you know, she deserves at least a mention. But Alfred. Oh, Alfred. Oh, Alfie, baby. Man, you got all kinds of problems. I mean, your haircut cut is fucked up. Yeah. Uh, your face needs a little bit, bit of a repairing. And where the fuck are your eyeballs? God damn. Yeesh. Oh, baby. Boy, this, this doll's got out a lot of problems. No wonder, no wonder it's got anger issues. Shit. Hell I, hell I would be if I got all those. Oh, man, killer dolls, man. I got to tell you. I wasn't always much for dolls, but I always had friends when I was a kid who had creepy dolls. They did, and it was just the beady eyes, and it was uh, the look on them. It always looked like they were watching you, and they were scheming against you. There's something about it that is instantly creepy and just kind of gets under your skin. And one that comes to life and stabs you to death? Well, that's a lot of kids' nightmares come to reality. Ah, Great. More nightmare fuel for kids. Guess I'll have to show this to my kid one day. Mm. I'm sure my girlfriend would love that. Open wide. Oh, the nest. They'll infest your mind. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Oh, ah, ah, look at that cover. Jeez. Oh, man. God. Talk about creepiness. Good lord, man. Man, man, that gives me nightmares. Woo! That is nightmare fuel, baby. Ooh. Man, to close your mouth. God damn it. You're just inviting those fuckers in your, in your fucking throat. Woo! God damn. When your nightmares come true, damn right. Ah, ah, ugh. They're all over the fucking cover, god damn it.
Jeez. What is this about? When Meg and her mother Beth visit a yard sale, Beth buys her young daughter an adorable stuffed bear. Aw, how cute. Thinking it may help with Meg's separation anxiety, as children do, she quickly becomes completely attached to the bear, talking to it and taking it everywhere she goes. Aw, that's sweet. Something tells me that's not going to last very long. However, of course, soon Beth notices that the bear is communicating with Meg and even influencing her daughter's behavior. Kind of sounds a little bit like Dolly Dearest. Then, when Meg starts developing strange hoarding habits and seems infected by a manipulative parasitic creature, a f that took a turn. Things take a turn for the worse. Soon it's clear there's something much more nightmarish and sinister to this yard sale toy than anyone could have imagined. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Jesus. A parasite in enveloping your your daughter and taking over her? Yeah, man. Uh, never buy used used stuffed animals at yard sales. That that I thought I thought that was already a given. God damn. <laughs> Jesus. Oh man. You know, there are some cool, like, killer insect movies that I really love, man. They're, they're really, obviously, old school stuff like them and, and everything. I mean, that's always cool. But there are, there are some really good ones out there. There really is, man. Like, for instance, I got to give a lot, a lot of love to a really great one. And that is none other than Mimic. Yes, Mimic is great. I love Mimic, man. What a great Guillermo del Toro film, man. I like that these insects are becoming smarter and growing and the size of human beings. I mean, Jesus Christ, man. Talk about, like, like cockroaches taking revenge. Yeah. It, it's really great, man, and it really gets under your skin. Really, really cool, cool one with great, great I insect effects, man. That is awesome. Love, love that movie, man. Of course, I also love another really great one. And that is none other than The Nest. Yeah, look at that. Roaches have never tasted meat until now. And she's just an appetizer. Ooh, I love that cover, man. What a great movie, man. Oh, man, killer in insects and in cockroaches eating people. It's so great. <laughs> it's cheesy as shit, but it's so fun, man. God, it really just gets under your skin. It really does. The Nest is, is awesome. That's a really good one. However, there is one more that I really do love quite a bit, and that is, ah, insect. Great. They arise out of nothing. They think they kill. What a great goddamn movie this is, man. Love it. I think the effects in here are really cool, man, where, where, where they're sort of breeding and they're growing and they're taking o over this this like uh like hospital setting oh it's so good man it's cheesy as shit but it's really fun man i, I really love it and steve railsback is great in this movie man it's so good so great man i mean there's some cool killer insect movies out there there really really is man truly now can the nest be one of them well it's always possible let's be real and it looks like you got D. Wallace in here as well. It looks like D at least. I mean, anything with D. D. Wallace has to somewhat be watchable. I mean, D is pretty cool, man. I did meet her at a convention. She is an awesome chick, man. Ah, uh, I don't know, man. See, I love a good creepy, crawly tale. I really do, man. I mean, it depends on how it's done. Sometimes it comes off as maybe a little cheapo. If you've got the right budget to it and the right effects, then it works. Even something like that old school William Shatner film, Kingdom of Spiders. There's something about that movie that, yes, it's kind of cheesy and ridiculous, but yet it's it's fun. And you go with it because, I mean, I mean, yes, it's cheesy, but it's Shatner cheesy. And there's, come on, with the shats, you got to love it, man. So when done right, when entertaining... Creepy crawlies can be quite good for for your cinematic palette. Is the nest one of them? Well, you've got creepy stuffed animal bears, parasitic insects, and D. Wallace. What do you think? Blood pageant. Let the blood fly. Yes, win at all costs. 
I love this cover, man. <laughs> I do. Look at that. That's Snoop, isn't it? That is, man. Snoop's just chilling out. He's like, like, yeah. Let's get on with the pageant, bitches. Yeah. <laughs> man, if only Martha Stewart was in this bitch. God damn, man. Now that would be pretty goddamn cool, man. Shit. When are we going to have Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart being a, a horror movie together? Shit, man. Man, I'd pay to see that. Damn. Oh, man. Stephen Baldwin is here as well. Huh. <laughs> I like that. Oh, that's cool. When? Lose or die. What begins as a million dollar reality show competition between seven beautiful women turns into a battle for life itself when one contestant uses magic to gain an edge over the competition. Hmm. An ancient curse dating back to the Salem witch trials is unleashed and the competition becomes a pageant of death, destruction, and evil forces. Forget about who will win. Oh, who will survive? Stephen Baldwin, Ted Lang from The Love Boat, Jesus Christ. Well, this one's got to be a winner. Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg and Dogg. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Snoop Dogg in a horror movie. Oh, shit. It was either this or Soul Plane 2. Yeah, we'll we'll take Blood Pageant. Oh, damn. Yeah, you know what, man? I do love Snoop, man. I mean, especially when it comes to to, to horror, and he is no stranger to horror. I mean, come on, he did do eh? Bones. He did. Oh, I mean, how many movies can you really say have a demonic evil entity in? In Snoop Dogg that is out for revenge. How many goddamn movies? Well, there is only one. And Bones is awesome, man. Bones is cool. I love, I love that fucking movie, man. So he is no stranger to the genre. Ah, but he definitely should do more, man. This this looks kind of crazy and wild and weird and and horrific and definitely all kinds of bloody. That's for damn sure, man. I just love the idea of a beauty pageant gone horribly, horribly wrong, man. I mean, honestly, my mother back in the day was watching all those, you know, beauty pageant reality show bullshit stuff. I mean, she was watching like Honey Boo Boo or whatever, whatever the fuck it was, man. And obviously, like, you know, uh, dance moms or, or whatever bullshit that was on at the time. And I always thought to myself, I'm like, God damn it. I would just love to see this pageant just just go all crazy and wild and wicked and and just all horrific and bloody. <sighs> I may not get it in real life, but I can always get it in, in movie form. And when one of the judges happens to be my man Snoop, dude, not only are you going to get fun hilarity, but you're going to get a shitload of weed. Prepare to be captive in hell. Oh, I like that. Creepy stare down. <laughs> to survive, they must obey. Ah, I did get a chance to watch this on Amazon Prime. I definitely did, man. And this is an interesting one. It really is. It went to places I wasn't quite sure where it was going to go, which kind of kept me on my toes, and I liked that. Basically, what the movie is about is it's about this couple who's been married for a long time, and it seems like there's issues with their marriage. Something's not quite right, and one night, this person or people end up getting into their home and drugging them, implanting them with some weird chip in their neck, and is sort of holding them, I don't want to say hostage, but holding them captive and basically forcing them to do things that that basically they're not willing to do basically torturing them in a lot of ways but it's not quite torture it's almost like they're they're testing their marriage in a lot of ways now i won't say exactly where this movie goes because that's part of the surprise of it 
But for the longest time, I was watching this movie, and I kept on asking myself, like, where's where's the actual point of why they're actually holding these people? Like, what's the concept behind this? Because it just feels like they're doing it just at random and giving them tasks to see how loyal they are to each other and their marriage. And I'm thinking, like, where is this going? Where is this all heading? And when you finally get the reveal, I got to admit, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought it was going to be something very mundane, very predictable, but I was not expecting where it went. And that was one of the pleasant surprises of the movie. I will say the movie is not the most original film you've ever seen. As far as like characters being held, you know, and forced to do things and being stalked. I mean, it's not like this breaks new ground or anything. I mean, it takes a lot of elements from a lot of uh, other movies. I mean, it takes an element from even a great movie like The Strangers. I mean, it really does. I mean, The Strangers is amazing. And the idea that these people are creeping around in in their house and torturing them and playing games. I mean, that kind of stuff is really great. And The Strangers is one of the best ones. I mean, even a, a movie like... F- uh, Funny Games is great, too. I mean, that's a re- really good one. So, I mean, Hell takes elements from other movies, but yet yeah, kind of spins it in its own way, which I really appreciated. It's It's got a lot of interesting elements about, you know, being weak and fighting for yourself and standing up for yourself and also a lot of very interesting feminist qualities, especially some of the 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 vibe that they give towards the end of the movie i like the torture stuff i like the idea that these characters are being tested mentally and physically i thought that was really interesting and i like the twists and turns here and i thought the kills were actually really great we don't get a lot of kills in this movie the kills are very sparse but when they do happen They're brutal, and they're bloody, and it's actually pretty good, all things considered, man. I mean, there were moments where the characters were dumb for dumb's sake, and certain times where you kind of kind of saw things coming just a little bit, but again, the twist, I did not see coming, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I like the idea of... I'll just say this, of this this group that is doing all this to to prove a point about marriage and holding people down and keeping them in their place, so to speak. And I thought that was an interesting idea, and I had never really seen that. I mean, I've seen it in certain instances, but not like this. And I thought it was kind of cool, and I thought it was kind of clever, and it was a different and unique twist that gave the movie a a better flavor than I think I was I was thinking it was going to be. Without that twist, I think this movie would have just been your average, everyday sort of, you know, stalker, torture type of movie. But with that twist... It breathes life into the movie that it wouldn't have had otherwise. So I really do appreciate that, man. I thought Hell was way better than it ever was supposed to be. And, I mean, as far as these type of movies are concerned, I mean, it doesn't exactly break new ground. It's not as good as The Strangers or Funny Games or a lot of those other movies. But as far as, like, one that's aping off of other films, it was pretty good. And I was really surprised, honestly. Uh, let's just put it this way. You better hope that your marriage is, is solid because if these days, if your marriage isn't, boy, these guys, they may just come a knocking and you definitely don't want that. Death for damn sure. Way better than it had any right to be, but it's pretty goddamn solid. I got to admit that, man. Pretty damn good. And what am I talking about? It's pretty damn good for the second Walmart love this week. I mean, let's be real. We, we've we had some real winners in this pile, and I loved every minute of it. So, who ordered the cheapo saw ripoff bloody? Anybody? Anybody? 
apparently not. Oh, yeah, you may have experimental sharks in your movie, but you're not really a great shark movie until you got an LL Cool J song in it, baby. Deepest, bluest, my head is like a shark's fin. Deepest, bluest, my head is like a shark's fin. Okay, it was a popular song back in the day. Give me a break, goddammit. <sighs> you people. Oh, killer life-sized owls. And we get ever that much closer to a killer Barbie movie. God, help our souls. <laughs> ah, somebody needs a major exterminator. Ah, bloody pageants with Snoop Dogg as one of the judges. You know, something tells me the one that smokes the most weed gets the prize. I mean, come on. <sighs> Sipping on gin and juice. Laid back. Okay, it was a good song back in the day. Give me a break, goddammit. Oh, and you thought you had marital issues? Ooh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, indeed, you have not. Look at this. Oh, wonderful Walmart indie weirdness gold. Oh, baby, you gotta love it, man. You got to love it indeed, and I definitely do, man. And I am so thankful for the second Walmart. You have no idea, man, because let's be real, okay? It's been a little bit of rough waters, okay, it has been, and it's kind of crazy to think about this, because it is a big release week, I mean, all things considered, it really is, and we saw a decent amount of media, you know, when we saw Mortal Kombat and everything that week, and here it's kind of a little bit of a struggle, and you never really know what you're going to get until you enter into the stores, and that is the God, honest to God's truth. I mean, truly, man. And it's kind of interesting because physical media is in a lot of ways actually making a comeback. I mean, all the stuff that has been announced, all the stuff that is coming out, I mean, business is a booming, baby. It really is. But then again, you see the stores and the correlation doesn't quite mix together. Unfortunately, that's just the name of the game when it comes to stores and physical media, man. Retail outlets and physical media haven't exactly been in harmony for quite a long time. Now, we're getting a lot of great releases coming up, and sometimes not so sure about every week for physical media. Will those worlds merge at some point? Well, I'd like to see it happen. I don't know whether it will, but I think regardless... I think with any format, you're going to get difficulties week in and week out because you just never know what's going to be in these stores, man. Some of the popular titles that you think is going to be there, unfortunately, <laughs> better luck next time, man. But I think physical media is only as strong as the support that it gets. And the one thing that I've been seeing at these stores as of late is that they're getting in more interesting titles because the physical media is selling. Because it is selling, because there's a hunger out there for it, and I see it at these stores, they're taking more chances in bringing in other titles and getting in more media than they would normally get. And that's a good sign to me. And look, at the end of the day, Physical media is only as important as how we make it. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're buying a small, little, unknown indie title or you're buying the big blockbuster of the week. It doesn't matter, man, because any small support that you give physical media goes right back into keeping it alive and supporting the format and supporting the cause. That is important, man. I mean, physical media has been bombarded so many times over so many years, and now I'm starting to see a small resurgence. And, you know, sometimes you have to... You have to basically make your voice heard through your wallet, through your buying habits and your decisions. And it shows. 
it really honestly does that physical media is still important when there's a sea of digital all over the place when it seems like physical media has taken so many hits and and beat downs and just having its face in the mud it's still around and god knows i've seen so many articles and so many videos about the death of physical media the end of it they've been predicting that shit for years guys absolutely years i mean five ten years they've been all always saying physical media is dead it's dying it's done give it up and yet we keep on coming back to it why because we know the importance of it we know the value of it and we know that it's it's a format that is perfect for keeping these films alive for keeping the voice of some of these unheard gems around and perhaps it's a format that's going to save movies at the end end of the day i think there's so many ways and reasons to still love physical media and sometimes the correlation between the stores and the uprising of physical media sometimes doesn't always go together but I think slowly but surely times might be changing ever so slightly. It's never a guarantee, but if we still go out of our way to support this, if we still, you know, put our blood, sweat, and tears into keeping this alive, then maybe, maybe one day those two realities and those worlds might come back together again. And maybe, just maybe, there will be a day when you'll see Best Buy be the way they used to. And you'll see all these cool little boutique label releases at, at the Walmarts and the Targets of the world. We're seeing it, guys. It's ever so slightly, but we're seeing it. Never give up hope, because you never know where the future lands until you decide to make an effort to keep it alive. And you've been doing that. And so have I. As long as we keep our voices alive and heard, there's nothing we can't do. Absolutely. And I truly do believe that, guys. When it comes to physical media, I gotta believe it. And that's for damn sure, guys. Hey, you gotta keep it alive for some of the really weird Walmart indie goodness. I mean, come on. Where else are you gonna find this shit? <laughs> Seriously, man. Oh, it's too good not to show off. And the way this week is going, hey, that's definitely a pleasant, pleasant surprise indeed. However, we've got one more location to go to, and, well, could it be a killer end to a very fascinating physical media video? Well, I guess we're just about to find out. All right, everybody, we are at our fourth and final location, and it's been... An interesting physical media week, that's for damn sure. And when you're in a game with Jigsaw trying to find all the physical media love, well, it's going to be a little bit more harder than anticipated. And it definitely has been. But we've seen a little bit of love. Hasn't been terrible. But what will the Beast have in store for us? Well, hopefully the Beast ends up supplying all the love that it possibly can. You know how the Beast does it. So how about we go in and check it out and where we are at none other than Best Buy The Beast. Best Buy, baby. And let's be real, it's been a little bit of uh, a time or two trying to find physical media. There's been moments where we found a lot and there's been moments where we've had a little bit of struggles and issues. Yeah, it's been that kind of physical media week. But could everything turn around with The Beast? The final location will Best Buy save the entirety of the day. Well, maybe the old Best Buy. New Best Buy, not so much. But, well, still, I have high hopes. And I'm praying to the physical media gods. So let's hope they hear me. Let's head in and check it out. All right, we are in at Best Buy. And I am definitely seeing some new release love. Oh, yes, I am. With the Blu-ray DVD digital of Spiral from the book of Saw for $19.99. The 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray digital for $27.99. And that's a really odd cover, man. I mean, I love the Spiral with his eye. But, like, 
the weird greenish color it's it kind of very weird man i mean i kind of like this cover better but it's such a weird odd odd and unique cover that you kind of can't help but kind of want to stare at it <laughs> a very unique one for the 4k but they also have oh they have the only at best buy exclusive steelbook for 29.99 4k blu-ray digital baby look at this more of that spiral love, man. I, I like that with sort of Chris Rock there holding the the flashlight and looking very ominous. I, I like that, man. It's actually not a bad steal. It's not so bad, actually. It's pretty nice. I don't know, man. If, if I had to say, I'd probably say my favorite would probably be this artwork right here. That would probably be my favorite, all things considered. But I do like that steel book, though. That's not bad art. I think all of them are a pretty de de decent art. Just that with the weird green, man. It's kind of odd to me. But, hey, whichever one you choose, hey, you get different artwork. So that's not half bad, man. You know how I love my variety when it comes to artwork. And you get it all on display here at the Beast. Not bad, man. Now, this movie is directed by Darren Lynn Bowsman. And... He is no stranger to the Saw franchise. Oh, no stranger at all, man. He directed Saw 2, Saw 3, and Saw 4. He directed some of the best as far as Saw sequels are concerned. And you're thinking, okay, he's not bad. I mean, he also directed Repo the Genetic Opera. He ended up directing a segment from Tales of Halloween. He also directed that indie horror flick, uh, The Death of Me. Which wasn't bad, honestly. I actually kind of dug that one. Not perfect, but it's okay. And so I'm thinking, okay, he knows what he's doing. He's been in this Saw world but before. If you're going to get anybody back other than James Wan, you'd get Darren Lynn Bowsman, And that's who you'd get. And they did. And there's a recipe for success here. I mean, Chris Rock said he's a huge fan of the Saw franchise. He loves it. And I'm thinking, like, Chris Rock is a huge fan of the Saw franchise? Yeah, apparently. So... You have him coming in and writing, or helping to write the screenplay, uh, starring in it, getting that star power in there along with Samuel L. Jackson, getting a, a um, very veteran director of the Saw world. So there, there's a lot of things going for this movie, but yet it didn't work the way it was supposed to. And it's kind of interesting to me because every franchise at some point gets tired, right? Every franchise does. Whether we're talking about Nightmare on Elm Street or Halloween, Friday the 13th, uh, Puppet Master, Chucky, you name it. There's a con There comes a point where every franchise gets a little tiresome and they try to do something unique and different and outside the box to revitalize the franchise. And sometimes that works and other times it falls by the wayside. With Spiral, I appreciated the effort, but it felt like, on one hand, you have a Chris Rock cop comedy mixed with a Saw movie, and those two worlds just don't collide well with one another. They they really don't, man. And Chris Rock kind of felt like an odd man out in this movie. Hell, Samuel Jackson felt kind of odd. I never saw the Saw franchise as being big Hollywood actor territory. I, I never saw that. But apparently here, yeah. But it just doesn't work, man. I mean, I like the concept and I like the idea. But again, it's a copycat Jigsaw killer and this is a copycat Saw movie. And... At the end of the day, do you really want a copycat Saw movie? No, you really don't, man. And it just doesn't really work out the way that it was meant to. Again, I like Chris Rock, but I like Chris Rock in the right type of role. See, I mean, even in something like uh, Lethal Weapon, he was fine in Lethal Weapon, but he felt like the odd man out. Chris Rock has a brand of comedy and a brand of acting that that doesn't always mesh with with the movie that he's trying to be in. It doesn't always he doesn't always really pull it off. And this is one of those times when he didn't really pull it off the way he was supposed to, man. And look, 
the other problem with this franchise is that you're so far removed from Jigsaw. You're so far removed from the storyline that you have to create a new villain, a new mythology, and that takes time, and that takes a lot of of effort to try to get the fans re-engaged with a new character outside of John Kramer. And sometimes that works in other franchises, but for the most part, uh, it's it's easier said than done because it doesn't really work all that well, man. I mean, at the end of the day, it it really doesn't, man. I mean, I give them credit because there's a lot of people here that are veterans to the Saw franchise, whether it's a lot of the producers who have been on pretty much all of them, whether it's the director who has directed some of the top-notch Saw sequels. But again, just because you have that doesn't mean that the movie's going to turn out all right. doesn't mean the movie's going to work out the way you think it does. And Spiral's a prime example of that. It doesn't really. As much as I, as much as I enjoyed seeing the new world of Spiral, this new Saw world come together, Saw is like lightning in a bottle. It really is, man. If you really think about it, if you go back to that first Saw movie, that is lightning in a bottle, man. That really is. And it captures something that can never be captured again. And I think the Saw sequels ended up taking that momentum and spinning it into very unique horror tales of, of psychology and what it means to actually be alive and how do you value your 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 life and what ways do you and how far are you willing to go for that i think there is some interesting stories to be told within the saw world that have come out because of this movie and all the imaginations that that really it sparked but i just don't see that with this movie man i mean i think the problem with this movie is that it tries to be too woke it tries to go for the whole like you know, going against the cops and the cops are bad and it it tries to be very timely for the times that we're living in and yeah, maybe that works a little bit but with the comedy and with some of these actors that I didn't really feel needed to be in this movie I felt that the Saw franchise doesn't need big name actors I think the story and the traps and everything speak for themselves it's an interesting experiment in revitalization. It's an interesting experiment in, in a spin-off. But I would have rather it seen a straight-up sequel for Jigsaw and really dive back into those characters and the mythology rather than try to create a whole n- new one. Just doesn't quite work the way you, you want it to. And tired franchises taking new directions that don't work it's happened many many times and spiral is yet another one in the long line of horror sequel spinoffs that just fortunately fall flat on its face yeah i hate to say it guys but it is the truth however you do have a lot of special features here holy shit man you have a ton of audio commentaries a lot of featurettes theatrical trailer teaser trailer i mean you get a lot of stuff man i mean damn (laughs) for for just a so-so movie man it it really packs a punch in the special feature department i mean cool if you love the movie man you're getting a hell of a bargain but i don't know man i mean i love the saw franchise and i want to see the saw franchise continue but the approach on how to get there is going to be mixed I would like to see a sequel to Jigsaw. Other people will like to see a sequel to Spiral. Other people would just like to see it just stop and end and just end it where where it laid, and that's it. What's the right recipe for success when it comes to a Saw film? Well, back in the day we knew what it was, but now it's not so easy anymore. Certain franchises maybe should just end, and... Maybe some need to continue. Where does Saw land? Honestly, uh, just like John Kramer, I do think the Saw franchise needs to quietly go into that good night.
They also have a couple of the new additions for the Saw films. I know they all came out this way. New interesting additions for all of the Saw movies with new slipcover artwork to them. Blu-ray digitals here for $9.99. They only have a couple of them here, but I know all of them got released this, this week in this sort of format. And it's actually kind of nice because you have the actual, like, feature of like the saw and one of the featured weapons from the movies oh that's interesting look at that some of the featured trap stuff that they had that's cool nice i kind of like 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 that actually if you sort of feel feel the 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 artwork it's like yeah the ridges of the blades and everything that's cool nice i mean most people probably are already picked up the saw 4k love but you know if you didn't and you only want you know, sort of a new blu-ray of the original saw movie hey go for it man that and they also got a jigsaw as well and i gotta tell you man i do love jigsaw i mean really i thought it was a really great bounce back from obviously the supposedly last movie in the franchise the final chapter which i thought was uh fr frankly bantha poodoo <laughs> I thought it was pretty bad, man. I mean, but I thought Jigsaw was a nice, real comeback. I like the story of the detectives. I like the double cross and the deception. And I love the mystery and the intrigue. And I really loved sort of the the great twist at the end. And I wanted to know more. I just don't think we're going to get it. I mean, never say never, but they're probably going to do a spiral sequel before they ever do a jigsaw sequel and i just really wish they would man damn ah i love the saw movies saw movies are great well most of the saw movies are great what can i tell you however i will say man that honestly the first one versus this one well i'll take the original saw but all of them are pr pretty cool i know i wasn't saying great things about spiral but the saw franchise is really amazing if you're willing to dive into a new horror franchise that does a little bit more with psychology and and messing with your mind and cool creativity with the traps and everything, yes, it's not old school horror, but I think it's some of the best of the new school horror, and I think it works really well, man. Star Trek Discovery Season 3, baby! For $34.99, nice to see a little Star Trek love at the Beast. Oh, and speaking of a little more love, Steelbook love. Ah, yeah, look at that. That's actually really cool. I kind of like that with, with, with sort of the, the Starfleet sort of logo there with the stars. Nice. I like that. Very interesting, man. Not bad at all. I definitely dig this. This one better than that one. That's for damn sure. Yeah, I like that. That's nice. Cool. Dude, Star Trek Discovery, man. And boy, what a divided show Star Trek Discovery is. God damn, man. I don't think I have ever seen, truth be told, I don't think I've ever seen a Star Trek show be as divided as this one is. I mean, there's been some just eh, okay Star Trek shows, but not one that divided the fan base like this. And I think it div divides it between new school and old school. I really do, man. I'm telling you, it, it, it divides people in a big, bad way. And honestly, I've seen bits and pieces of Star Trek Discovery. I've seen a little bit from season one, a little bit from season two. I saw recaps and reviews for Discovery season three. And honestly... I appreciate them continuing the franchise. I've always loved Star Trek in one iteration or another. But if I gotta be real, I'm an old school uh, Star Trek fan. I'm old school, man. I, I really am. That's just, just who I am. I'm old school light like that. I mean, I was somebody who grew up with the original series. I was watching Next Gen and voyager and deep space nine and the old school star trek movies that was me that was my star trek generation in a lot of ways or multiple generations that i've loved of star trek over the years and i feel like star trek has morphed and changed it, it's become much more i don't want to say commercialized because that's not the right word but i would say it's 
it's become much more action oriented and less about the philosophy than it used to be put it that way i mean and, and maybe that might have started before jj abrams but jj abrams definitely brought that that level into the Star Trek realm. And I don't hate that Star Trek reboot. I actually think that Star Trek reboot is actually really good. It's way better than I thought it was going to be. Because at first I was like, oh, I don't know about this, man. Time travel and and resetting stuff and new Spock and new Kirk. And I was like, oh, I don't know. But man, it really impressed me. Now, the sequels, not so much, man. That's been a little bit more of a struggle to, to get into than I'd like. I think, I think that Discovery takes elements from the action-oriented times in later Star Trek with more philosophical ideas. The problem is it just doesn't meld well. The stuff I've seen at Discovery hasn't really hit me the way that old-school Trek has hit me. But then again, new school fans of Trek do really like Discovery, man. They, they really like it. They really love the characters and the action set pieces. But then I've heard a lot of older Trek fans really hate on it. And I've seen reviews where literally they are crapping all over this, this fucking show, man. They're really taking a piss on it. And I don't know. I guess I'm somewhere in between. It's not terrible, but it's not great either. I mean, I don't know, I consider it like, I suppose, on the same par as Enterprise. I mean, Enterprise was, was no, like, darling either. I mean, it was okay. I, I just think we've gotten so far away from Roddenberry's vision. I really think we have. If you look back at Roddenberry's vision, we're so far away from those times, man. We're, we're so far away from that world that Roddenberry had. And... Slowly but surely, over the course of many TV shows and episodes and movies, that concept and idea that he had has been chipped away. And I'm not saying that you can't do something new and interesting with Trek, because in order to revitalize it and to keep it strong, you have to, you have to do something new and different that's going to keep people energized and excited. But at the same time, you still have to have an essence of, of what made Star Trek Star Trek. And I feel like it's a battle right now. It's a battle between the old school fan base and the new school fan base. And it's the same thing with Star Trek and with many other franchises. You bring in the new school fans that don't have the same connection to the older stuff that you used to have. And they're not beholden to it. And they don't really want it. They something want something more exciting and more accessible and not as much thinking man and there's there's a little bit of a of a battle going on between the old school and the new school and discovery is trying to satisfy both ends and it's just not really working out the way i think that that it wants to it's not a terrible series it's not the worst thing in the trek franchise where everybody says it's the worst thing, but it's not exactly, like, beating down on, like, the best of Star Trek days. It's really not, man. I mean, it's decent, but I've seen way better Trek, but then again, not gonna lie, I've seen way worse. So, I I don't know, man. I mean, I, I, I'd like to see Trek go back to the old school ways, but... I just don't think we're ever going to get there, man. I mean, we'll always have the original series. We'll always have Next Gen. You know, I even love really Deep Space Nine. Even though that was heading more into action territory and war territory, I still really appreciate that. I mean, Voyager. Then again, Voyager was all about Seven of Nine. I mean, any, any nerdy boy can pretty much tell you that one. But, I mean, at the same time... Newer Trek I just can't get into, man. And I've I've tried, dude. I I really have, man. And I'm an old school fan. I like new school ideas if they're done in an interesting way that pays homage to old school and still respects what came before. That's easier said than done with a younger growing fan base that wants something much different than the old school. Who do you satisfy? How do you please everybody? Honestly, you just can't. Discovery uh, doesn't really pull it off the way, the way it's supposed to. Shame, though. I mean, it has moments where it's good, but eh, it does fail at times, too. 
I mean, you get a lot of special features, though. You get deleted scenes, a bunch of feature ads, gag reel, man, a ton, ton of great special features. I mean, if you like Star Trek, if you're an eternal fan of Star Trek and you've seen it all, then Discovery, sure, why not dive into it, man? But if you're an old school fan of Trek, if you like the old school stuff, the philosophy stuff, then I don't know if Discovery's for you, man. I mean, it's an interesting exploration but I think a lot of things have been done with Trek over the years. There's not much new that you can really do with Trek other than rehash the same stuff over and over again. And mm, if that's the case, I'll just stick with old school Trek. I mean, Discovery's not terrible, but as far as the overarching Star Trek mythology and franchise goes, well, uh, the Discovery, not really worth exploring. Then I'm seeing they have Die in a gunfight. Ooh, love is misery. Well, then again, so is this movie. Oh, yeah, I hate to admit it, but it is the truth, guys. I got a chance to watch this on Amazon Prime, man, and... Mm, ah, damn it. I, I wanted to watch it because of Alexandra Daddario. Man, do I love Alexandra Daddario. I mean, not only is she beautiful... But she's a good actress on top, top of that, man. And I uh, like, okay, uh, like a cool little, little, you know, action movie with Alexandra Daddario in it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give it a chance. Let, let, let's see how it is, man. Basically, it's about these, these star-crossed lovers, black sheep of the family, two powerful families in this long feud, and basically their love for one another and how everybody's sort of coming after them and the action and hilarity that sort of ensue from there. I don't know, guys. I don't know. I mean, to be fair, I, I mean, look, it's it's not a terrible movie. It's not like the worst goddamn little you know, action gunfight movie you've ever seen, but it doesn't exactly light the world on fire either. I mean, you get all the quirky characters, you get the quirky comedy, obviously the the hero getting the shit kicked out out of him, you know, the, the girl that has to prove herself. You get all of the stereotypes, all of the stuff here, man. It's trying to be, it's kind of like trying at least to be like something like Smoking Aces meets this sort of, this grand love story. And it doesn't work, man. It really doesn't. It comes off as really lackluster. And, you know, the voiceover is annoying. And some of these characters are uh, annoying. And you're just like, God, just get it done already. Jesus Christ, man. You know, like all this, all this, like that talking and everything. Like just, you know, just fucking shoot each other. <laughs> it's like, Jesus Christ, man. All of the melodrama and, and you know, all of the, the action, the, the quirkiness. I mean, some of the characters are, are cool, but some of the characters just come off as lame and limp dick and, and kind of underutilized as well. Some characters are completely forgotten about and never show up again. I don't know, man. I mean... I like a good quirky action gunfight movie. I mean, like I said, something like Smoking Aces is really cool, and I kind of like that, man. I mean, I like the idea behind the movie. Two powerful families, two star-crossed lovers, this long-standing feud, and the complications that go with it. It's a cool idea and a concept. It just well, it didn't really go anywhere, and that was the problem, man. I mean, I love Alexandra D Daddario, and she's hot as shit, but then again, I could watch her be hot as shit in anything. I mean, damn, I, I, I could watch her have, like, one button dangling from um, her fu fucking shirt in Texas Chainsaw 3D, which, by the way, I still, I still do not forgive those fucking producers for that one fucking button that can't, that can't seem to, like, get off of her goddamn fucking shirt. God, those bastards. I mean, that, or, like, she was great in True Detective Season 1. And she's been in some good shit, okay? I could see her be hot in a lot of other stuff, man. This doesn't exactly fit the bill. But then again, another thing going against this movie is they got fucking Justin Chatwin in this thing. God, I hate Justin Chatwin, man. Damn. 
God, do I hate him. I mean, Twilight and Avatar The Last Airbender. God, he cannot act himself out of a, a wet paper bag, for Christ's sake. Jesus. God, he's terrible here. He's just pining after Alexander Daddario constantly. Oh, my God, I need you, and I want you, and I can't live without you. And and he's just he's just the, the one constant in this thing, man. It's just, like, whining and wanting her. I'm like, I'm like, damn, dude, there is more pussy in the world you do realize that right like she's not the only pussy in the entire galaxy i mean there is more in the world here but damn i mean she's she's a hot piece of ass don't don't get me wrong but i mean you're you're a mobster you know you're part of the family I, I guess you got good looks i mean fuck you got money i mean you 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 could get a hot piece of ass anytime you want i mean if she doesn't want you, she doesn't want you. Go, go, go try to, to rape some other chick, man. Damn. I mean, jeez. <laughs> if that's the only way you, you can get a chick, <laughs> maybe you should just stick with hooking up with that bald hat dude from Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> fuck, man. Jesus, I don't know, man. Not a fuck, man. This movie. Uh, it's got some moments that I like, some quirky moments, but uh, you can watch that in a lot of other movies, man. Ah, this is one of those movies that's a copycat of other better films, and that's, hate to say it, all it'll ever be. Yeah, shame on that one. I mean, again, Alexander Daddario's hot, but again, I can watch two True Detective and get all the Alexander Daddario I want. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jeez, I mean, come on, man. Ah, oh, good lord, dude. But actually, a lot of great releases this week, a ton of stuff so far. I'm impressed. Let's see what else they got. And on the backside here, more physical media to check out. I think the physical media gods heard my plea. I think they did, guys. We got more to check out, baby. And the first thing I'm seeing over here is they got the 4K editions of G.I. Joe Retaliation and G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra for $19.99. So they do have those two 4K editions. They also have the Blu-ray Digital of Initiation for $15.99. And I got to admit, I do like this cover. I really dig this cover. Like, if you were just walking around checking out the physical media and you came upon this cover, that's a cool cover. You would dig that cover. That would kind of be like an intriguing thing. Ooh, ooh, that's, that's interesting. And it kind of would pique your interest to want to buy, man. But I just love it, man. We're like the killer stalker is in back of her, and she's like, "What's behind me? What?" And you're just like, "Lady, run! Get the fuck out of the way!" You're like, "Run, bitch, run!" <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh, you know that whole slasher horror logic of like stupid characters not running from the killer when they should. Ah. <sighs> And we got another one of them, guys. God damn it. Yes, I watched this thing on Amazon Prime. I did. And I watched it because it was a slasher movie, okay? And I am a horror lover. I love slashers. And I'm like thinking, okay, what's wrong with another slasher? Who, who doesn't like a good slasher? Well, well. I was hoping it was going to be good. Ah, damn it. I mean, truth be told, there is some good things in this movie. I like some of the brutal kills. Like, the, the killer is really just, like, brutally stabbing people and very vicious. I mean, I like that. I like the look of of the killer. I, I think it's kind of unique. I, I like that. It's interesting. I like the college campus setting. There is something about that that I like. But then again, other movies have done that before, so not that like, that's anything new. But I, I still liked it regardless. Outside of that, ooh, I got a lot of problems with this thing, man. <laughs> I, I really do. I mean, basically, the movie is about this fraternity and this sorority, and something potentially terrible and life-altering happens. And there's a killer on the loose that is hunting these people down potentially because of it. And they have to survive this killer or they're going to be picked off one by one. I mean, pretty much that's what it is, man. And 
I mean, it's not like we haven't seen these type of movies before. We have. There's been a whole shitload of these type of, you know, sorority, college, murder type of movies, man. There's been a ton of them. And, and yet, there's so many slashers that this movie could learn from, and yet... It does the most predictable, mundane shit you could possibly imagine. I mean, this is really predictable. And I'm serious, man. I mean, you know who's going to die. You know who's going to survive. Hell, you even know who the fucking killer is. I mean, they pretty much tell you who it is and hint at it. Like, like less than halfway into the movie, man. You know who this motherfucker is. And if you don't... You have not been seeing enough slashers, man. Because if you've seen a decent amount of them, you know what's coming. I mean, they have this sort of college kid, creepy kid that, that's hitting on the chick. He's kind of like this red herring, but you know it's not him. You know they're just kind of fooling you. You know who it is, man. And they telegraph that shit a mile away, man. I mean, they, they re really do. There's nothing new and inventive in that whatsoever. I mean, yeah... It might be predictable, but it would have been cool had you actually rooted for any of these motherfucking characters. I can't root for nobody in this thing, man. I mean, all of them are terrible human beings one way or another. Whether it's the frat guys who is ignoring it and don't give a shit. Whether it's the sorority chicks that are trying to sort of... Um, just sort of pretend it never happened to the chancellor who's just washing it all away i mean all of these characters are scumbags <laughs> in one way or another man i can't root for nobody in this bitch like like seriously damn man i mean my god i mean at the end of the movie i was like well that's a thing <laughs> i was like shit i was like it'd be nice to root for somebody i can't root for nobody here it's bad man it really is bad I mean, I like the way that the killer kills. I like the way that he, he uses this drill to sort of drill into people. And it's kind of cool. But then again, you've seen that before, whether it's like, you know, uh, you know, drill or killer or some other movies like that. I mean, I mean, you've seen it before a time or two. It's not that this movie's inventing anything you hadn't already seen. But I mean, man, it's just I like a good on-campus killer is stalking people and you know you you got to survive movie there's been a few of those out there i mean classic ones out there like pieces which is really cool or sorority house massacre that that's cool cool too i mean there's there's so many out there that that are really great man old school ones and this movie felt like it took a lot of ideas from a lot of different slashers, mixed it in in a pot of shit, and we got initiation. Ah, damn, man. I mean, I'm always up for a good slasher. I like a good slasher, but one that sort of rips off other ideas that were done better in other m movies, that's not a thing. It's just the same old crap, just regurgitated into something new. But it doesn't work, man. I mean, maybe I'm just an old school slasher fan. Maybe I'm I'm an old cur curmudgeon and I'm a boomer, uh, or whatever you want to call me, man. But the old school days were so much more better than some of this new shit. I mean, I'm not saying all the new shit is bad. Some of it can be really good, but it's a dime and a dozen, man. And when it comes to initiation, man, I wish the fucking killer killed this goddamn fucking movie. And you know we needed to get a little Walking Dead love. Yes, the complete 10th season, Blu-ray Digital for $44.99. Ah, yes, The Walking Dead. Man, oh man. Just when you walk away, just when you think you've had enough of it, then they suddenly improve, and you're coming back for more. God damn it, ah. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. God oh, damn it. Oh, man. And truth be told, hey, if they got better, they got better. And give them credit for it, man. I mean, I mean, truly. But John and I was having a very interesting discussion. It was about a different franchise, but Walking Dead sort of came into the discussion. And how franchises start off as one thing and then they completely turn into another whether you like it or not and with the walking dead it was all about the zombies it was humanity versus the walking dead and 
how The Walking Dead was really about like hopelessness and these zombies walking around and they used to be us but they're not us anymore and we could be better than than they are and there was a certain amount of hope to that and at some point with any franchise things shift it it can no longer be the same as what it used to be and now we have you know these warring factions this turf war we have you know betrayals and mistrust and all these complications with these characters and you know uh, you know who to trust and who not to trust and it's just it's just one complicated situation after another and unfortunately the zombies have kind of taken a little bit of a back seat to all of this. I mean, it really has. They're, they're sort of background fodder more than anything else. I understand it and I get it why they did what they ha- had to do and sometimes it really is true human beings are the dangerous ones of all and The Walking Dead has definitely exploited that and sometimes honestly exploited it for really powerful stuff like uh, The Governor was, it was uh, amazing or obviously in season two when they were hold the up the zombies and it was it was carol's daughter and the idea that you know they had kept them there and was that the right thing to do and there is moments of tension and philosophy that are really effective and very powerful when done right and the walking dead can do that it really can man it's able to do it not always but they've been able to pull it off from time to time i just miss the zombies being more of a focus i really do man and this happens with every franchise they take it to a different level and i i get it franchises need to evolve i understand this and the zombies maybe were never going to be in the forefront always they just weren't and i i get it man I don't know, dude. I mean, the the zombie genre was really hurting for a really long time, man. And The Walking Dead came along and it really revitalized it. I mean, you remember the old school days, night, dawn, day, return of the living dead, and everything in in between. It, It was a feeding frenzy. It was like a factory. Everyone was making great zombie movies and great zombie tales. And then it kind of died off. You know, copycat movies that weren't as good. Uh, you know, a lot of lackluster flicks out there, and it just kind of died off. And The Walking Dead revived it. It really did. A stale genre, and they they made it work. And I loved it, and I, I loved the creativity of it, and I loved the horror aspects to it, and I thought it was great. And then that slowly turned into something different, and it's changed. And... I get it. You know, change is essential. It really is. Change is essential, and it happens. Whether you like it or not, it does. Okay, fair enough. But I just miss the old school days of the zombies being in the forefront and not as an accessory that, you know, they bring in every now and again to say, hey, the the threat is still out there. I mean... I'm glad the show is ending. I really am. And I hope they have a really great ending season. And I I hope the finale is worth it for fans who have stuck by this through thick and thin. I really hope it does. But at the end of the day, it's not what it used to be. And I know that. And that's that's what kind of gets to to me. It, it, It really does, man. I mean, when it's all said and done, I'll I'll rewatch it again and give it a chance and get back on the horse but it really does need to end man and i'm glad that the kirkman ended the comic book i'm glad that he gave them a roadmap to end this thing because you know i saw some of the recap at the end of the the season there's like stormtroopers that are coming in like pe- people look, look like stormtroopers tr- and like who are these people now and it's like all oh, this crazy antics i'm like oh man like, I remember the old school days of the final episode of season one where they were in that medical facility and potentially trying to find a cure and they couldn't quite come up with one and the scientists whisper something in Rick's ear. And I always thought it wouldn't have been cool if they would have done something with that of like a cure possibly in, in the future and an unexpected one that, that, that they find through another scientist or something. Like, it would be really cool if they could do that, but... 
I know that that's never going to happen, guys. And those days are long gone. But I, I, I still wish it. But unfortunately, it just is never going to be what it used to be. That being said, things change, and sometimes they change for the better, and maybe The Walking Dead is one of those things that needed to change for the better. I just hope that at the end of the day, whatever the 11th season is, that it's satisfying and that it was well worth the, the journey. Good, bad, indifferent... I'll always enjoy what The Walking Dead did for the zombie genre, and I'll always appreciate the fact that... They did some inventive stuff when the genre was getting stale and really revitalized it. But we're so far away from those days. I don't know if we could ever get them back, man. But let me know what you guys think of that. I mean, you do get In Memoriam, audio commentary. You also get the six additional episodes of the extended season, including the long-awaited backstory, Here's Negan. And I know you guys... From what I know through like YouTube and blogs and everything, really love that Negan story. I do admit it was, it sort of was like well overdue. Let's put it that way, man. I thought they would have done that thing way ahead of time, but no, they finally got to it. It only took them like a few seasons longer than I was thinking, but sure, they finally got to that Negan backstory, man. Look, The Walking Dead is, a, is an interesting idea. And they've done some things that have worked and other things that, that haven't. I just miss the old school days of The Walking Dead. And however it ends, I'll always re remember those really great zombies in the first few seasons that really made it worth it. Who's up for Little Gangs of London, baby? Season 1 for twenty one ninety nine. Look at that. Cool. Oh, from AMC. Game of Thrones, but without the dragons. <laughs> okay. Weren't the dragons one of the cool parts of the show, though? <laughs> so, so you're taking one of the cool parts out? That doesn't seem right. Uh, come on, man. The Godfather meets the Raid. Okay, that's a little bit better. I love the Godfather, and I love the Raid. So that's the combo I'm willing to dig. Okay, not bad. Let's see what this is about. When Finn Wallace, the head of London's most powerful crime family, is assassinated, no one knows who ordered the hit. With rivals everywhere, Finn's impulsive son, Sean, takes over and puts a stop to all criminal business in London until his father's killer is found. As the city is torn apart by the power struggles of the international gangs that control it, Sean finds the only person he can rely on is Elliot, a low-level enforcer with a mysterious interest in the Wallace family. Okay, a little gang retaliation love? Possibly? Okay. I'm liking that. Doesn't sound too bad, man. Interesting. I, I do love Godfather. I, I do love the, the, the raid. You know, I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. Or I'll kick his ass. <laughs> okay, he didn't quite say it like that, but still. I mean, oh, man. Interesting, interesting. I, you know, I love a good gang tale, man. I, I really do, man. Old school gang stuff like Goodfellas, you know, um, obviously, you know, Casino, all, all that's mob technically, but kind of gangs at the same time, you know. But I like the idea of mystery, of intrigue, of who the killer might might be, the the violence and the vengeance of it. Okay, it's kind of interesting. I, I can dig that kind of stuff with some cool action mixed in together. Cool sort of crime action tale. Not bad. Ooh, they got Cole Meany in here from Star Trek. Awesome. That's cool. And it's from AMC, too. I got to admit, man, I used to watch AMC. I mean, I used to watch The Walking Dead, but back in the day, I definitely enjoyed that. Of course, I watched um, that Kevin Smith show that was on AMC, which I really in in enjoyed. I thought that, that was cool. I don't really watch much TV anymore. I, I really don't, man. It's not that I don't like a lot of the stuff that's on TV. Some of it's really inventive and cool, but honestly... I got a lot of movies to watch, man, so it's like TV, I don't got much time. So in order for me to get into a TV show, it's got to be really special. It's got to be something that really piques my interest in, in the most most really noteworthy way, something that really has me so intrigued that I want to watch it. 
shows like Stranger Things that I love and I keep coming back to over and over again. You know, some of the Marvel stuff. I mean, that stuff that I that I love. I like a good gritty gang drama tale. I wonder how far can they really stretch this? I mean, you can go one season with mystery and intrigue and and questions, but how long can you really go along with this until until it kind of feels like it's a rubber band and it's so stretched out that it's going to break? I I wonder. And some TV shows are able to pull off a little bit of extended stuff, like like Peaky Blinders, which is amazing. Peaky Blinders is, is fantastic. They've been able to really extend it in a great way that is really awesome and continues to be intriguing and fucking amazing. Gangs of London, well, it has an interesting idea, but let's be real, you're no Peaky Blinders, and if you don't have have the dragons, you shouldn't really even call yourself Game of Thrones. Oh, and we ain't done yet, because we got a little Jacob's wife. Yes, she will prey on you. Oh, yes, she will. Oh, Barbara Crampton will, baby. Yes, indeed. Oh, my God. This movie, man. This goddamn movie. Okay, so I got a chance to watch this on Amazon Prime. And I wanted to watch it because of Barbara Crampton and Larry Fesenden. Two experts within the horror genre two people that have definitely made their mark within the horror realm both in front and behind the camera and i was like okay a little interesting vampire tale with both of them i gotta at least give this a chance and that's what i did basically it's about this preacher and his wife played by larry pheasanton and barbara crampton and they're your typical bible thumping older couple and Yet at the same time, it's very mundane. They're doing the same thing over and over again. Both of them are not happy, especially Barbara Crampton. And it feels like life is going nowhere and she's frustrated by things. And one day, an old flame of hers comes into town. Okay, great, right? I mean, wow, I haven't seen him in a long time and maybe I'll meet up with him. Not really to like do anything with him, but honestly, to just kind of rekindle that feeling again and feel important and and sexy and and feel like she's worth it so she does that maybe she needed to have stayed home oh man because they end up getting attacked by this weird like imposing vampiric creature that is feeding on, on her and suddenly she's like slowly becoming a vampire and craving blood and and eating people and the husband is going nuts trying to figure out what's going on with with my uh, my wife and it's all the hilarity and the complications and the buckets and buckets of blood and when i mean buckets of blood oh goddamn do i mean buckets of blood holy shit man damn they did not spare any expense on, on the blood on this one Woo. let me tell you something man I thought I was going to enter into a mundane movie. I really did. I was like, I think this premiered on Shudder or something. And, and I was like, ah, I don't know. God damn it. I've seen so many vampire movies over the years. I said, what the hell is this one going to do? But fine, I'll give it a chance. And you want to know what, guys? This movie was fucking awesome. I'm serious. This was great. Holy shit. This was amazing, man. I love this. I had a great time with this movie. This is fantastic. Seriously, like, Larry Fenton and Barbara Crampton are amazing here. Especially Barbara Crampton, man. God, there's a reason why she is a Scream Queen. She deserves the Scream Queen moniker, man, because, dude, she is awesome here. I, I love how she plays sort of weak and timid and scared, and suddenly becoming a vampire opens her up. She becomes confident, and she's more terrifying and, and creepy and more evil and and i just love how she's slowly changing wearing sort of the the mundane dresses and covering everything up and suddenly opening up her world and showing more more cleavage and and you know dolling herself up and looking more sexy and confident and and i i, I loved it man i just love that shit so much dude and i love the kills in here the kills are brutal 
I mean, when these people bite into people, it's not like a simple, like, interview with the vampire thing where, like, it's like, like, it's like just a simple, like, getting into to your neck very slowly and sensually and erotically. No, 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 man. They are, like, eating you like you're a goddamn uh, fucking burger at McDonald's, man. They're fucking chowing down on that shit, man. Damn, dude. Jesus Christ. They, they are just like... <laughs> they are literally just gnawing at your fucking neck and eating all parts of you. Damn, any way to get to your fucking blood, they're getting there, man. And they don't care how they do it. Damn, man. It was it was great, man. Jesus. It was gory as hell, bloody as hell. It was amazing, and it was awesome, and it was great, and I loved it, and I love the effects in the movie. I love the effects of being a vampire in this world, and things that you're affected by, and things that you're not affected by. Like, she goes to the dentist, right? Simple enough, she goes to, to the dentist. She gets an x-ray, and the x-ray of her teeth is slowly burning her, and I love it because, again, it's UV light. And I and, and I love that. I thought it it was clever. Certain things that that they did. Every sort of average mundane thing. They had a really interesting twist that that you didn't expect or wouldn't expect in a vampire movie. But they did it. And what I loved about the movie even more is that they really they really dived into a lot of things you weren't expecting. I mean, yes, there's a whole parts of the movie where you're expecting, okay, she becomes a vampire. Yes, they're going after the master and they're going to kill the master and everything like that. And there's all these sort of cool little twists and turns in the movie that, yes, some are predictable, but they're fun predictable. Like, you you go with it because it's tongue-in-cheek fun, which makes it worth it, which is what I like. And other twists and turns that you don't see coming, you think it's going to be this average, mundane vampire movie, and they go that extra mile to make it entertaining and to make it fun, and you just have a blast with this movie, man. I mean, even even sort of the vampire makeup effects, like for the master, the master looks like something out of, um, I mean, like, like Nosferatu or... Like uh, like a Stephen King adaptation, uh, like Salem's Lot or something. Like it looks straight out of like Salem's Lot, but more fucked up. Like it looks great. Like I loved it, man. I thought it was awesome, and it's got those really great sort of mundane, dry humor to it, and yet it's also in in a weird way like a female empowerment movie at the same time and it's kind of weird to say that but it really is true like the master being female barbara crampton being a female and living this mundane life and the vampire trying to give her a better life and as being a stronger person and not letting the, these men bring her down it's weird because i never thought i'd see a vampire tale that that ended up incorporating sort of you know feminist sensibilities <laughs> but I did, and I loved every second of it, man. I thought it was great. Oh, my God, this is awesome, man. The acting is phenomenal here. They're having fun as hell time with this movie. The effects are great. The story, you actually like these characters. Like, the preacher is kind of mundane at first, but you get to know him and like him and and sympathize with him, and you sympathize with Barbara Crampton, and yet you're sort of terrified of her, like she's going to bite your fucking head off. Like, I love that shit. This is so good, man. This movie is fucking phenomenal, dude. And Barbara Crampton, man. Like I said, I love Barbara Crampton. She is absolutely amazing and absolutely phenomenal. And like I said, she deserves all of that great Scream Queen praise that she has gotten over the years. You know, whether, of course, it's From Beyond or You're Next or obviously Reanimator and many, many others that she's done. I'm so glad that she's made a comeback, man. She's amazing. I met her at a convention. Nice chick. Incredibly nice. And she goes for this role, man. She dives into the fake blood and and the vampire effects. And how you even get to see some Barbara Crampton boob action, baby. <laughs> Jesus, man. She went all out for this role. And God bless her sexy ass heart, man. I love Barbara Crampton. I love Larry Pheasanton. And with them in this... They they elevated this material so much more than it could possibly ever be elevated. But if you think you're walking into a mundane zombie movie, you are so dead wrong. There's a lot of terrible 
vampire movies out there. There are terrible, terrible vampire tales out there. There really is, man. And and yet, I kind of thought this was going to be one of those just straight to DVD, boring, typical everyday ones. It just is like, eh, I'm I'm bored by this. I don't care. But honestly, they did it in a way that took the mundane and predictable and made it entertaining and fun. And honestly, I've seen so many vampire tales that I forget that there can still be good vampire movies out there when done right. And Jacob's Wife, crazy enough, as far as recent ones, is one of them. It's awesome. It's great. You get the making of Jacob's Wife, deleted scenes, not bad, man. I mean, I, I gotta admit, man, I, I just... Look, man, I mean, the lowest of the low is Twilight. Okay, the lowest of the low. I mean, man, a fucking vampire sparkling, man. Who the fuck wants that? CGI ba- babies, wolves imprinting on little children. Jesus Christ, man. I mean, I, I sometimes forgot what a good vampire movie is, man. I mean, we're so far removed from the days of Blade and the Lost Boys and Near Dark and all that other stuff. But honestly, Jacob's Wife reminds me that... Vampire movies can still be good. You can still make good ones out there. You just need a little Scream Queen love to get you there. Not bad, man. Not bad at all. Great fucking movie, man. That was a hell of a great time watching that. And well worth it. God damn it is. Not bad, man. Some really great stuff this week. Really phenomenal stuff, man. Actually, you know what? The physical media gods definitely answered my prayers. That is for damn sure. All right. Let's head out. Come on. Say it with me now. You know you want to. And I know I definitely do. Oh, yeah. Best fight delivered, baby. Yes. Yes, it did, baby. It delivered. It's been a while since I've been able to do that, man. And they definitely did. A lot of indie love, new release love, steelbook exclusives. Oh, they had it all this week. And that is for a damn sure guy. That was really, really great, man. That is awesome. This is what Best Buy should be every single week. Let's be real on that one, guys. As I said, the physical media gods definitely answered my prayers in a big, bad way. Hey, they listened for once. God damn it. <laughs> Indeed, they did, man. Really, really great. Really solid physical media love here at The Beast, as it normally should be, by the way. Really fantastic, man. I loved it this time around. And a lot of really awesome stuff to see, awesome stuff to talk about. Oh, yeah. When physical media is on fire, it definitely is. And Best Buy definitely supplied the flames in a great, great, awesome, awesome movie-loving way. They definitely did, baby. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I definitely did. Let's head home and finish the video. All right, everybody. That'll do it for the Blu-ray and DVD out and about video this week. And you want to know what, man? Boy, it started out incredibly downhill and we slowly but surely kept picking up until we got to the peak of the mountain at the beast, baby. Look, I always pray to the physical media gods. They don't always listen to me, but every once in a while they do answer my prayers, and this time they definitely did, man. I mean, ooh, I thought this was going to be a minefield, and we didn't see anything over at the first Walmart. I'm like, ooh, that, that supremely sucks. <laughs> so I'm like, oh shit, man, what are we in for? And we were picking ourselves up along the way, man. At the end of the day, we saw a hell of a lot of media, a lot of really great high titles and some really awesome physical media love. I can't complain. It was all it was all good, man. But you never really know what you're going to get until you go and do the out and abouts. And it really is true. And I prove that every single damn week, guys. It was a doozy this week, but a lot of really great physical media that came out this week. Let me know what you guys are checking out, what you picked up. Let me know. As far as I'm concerned, well, ooh, well, a certain amount of physical media love I got this week. Indeed, I did. Now, the first thing is I got to still talk about the great subscriber love that I got, man. I mean, first off... Journey to the End of the Night, which is awesome, with Brendan Fraser 
This is cool, man. I have never heard of this movie, and I am a Brendan Fraser fan. I mean, obviously, The Mummy and Airheads, Encino Man, Gods and Monsters, and many, many others. He's an awesome actor. I, I've loved him in so many m movies. He's, he's brilliant of an actor. And finding a gem that I haven't seen before? That's pretty awesome, man. So that was really cool to, to get, man. I gotta admit, that was awesome. And also, I have to admit, getting Mulholland Falls was pretty damn cool as well, man. My God, this is a blast from the goddamn past. I haven't seen this thing in decades. But I remember really loving it, and I love a good detective tale, and the cast is amazing. It is really cool, dude. And so, man, some more Kino Lorber love for the collection. That is pretty damn cool, man. I just want to say thank you to you guys so much. I mean, for both of these titles, that is absolutely amazing, man. I mean, I've, I've always said it that I, I don't expect anything from you guys, but you have been absolutely amazing sending stuff that I've never heard of or things I haven't seen in a long-ass time. You guys really do go out of your way to to give me some really awesome media, and this just proves it. This is amazing. Absolutely awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Beyond Words. That pretty damn cool. Just saying, man. That is awesome. Oh, that is far from it, guys, because I also actually ended up picking up a title at Best Buy. Oh, this one. Oh, I definitely want it in a big bad way, man. I love the movie, and I couldn't leave Best Buy w without it. And that is none other than Jacob's wife. And oh, look at Barbara cramped in there. <laughs> this is great. Oh my god, man. God damn it. This was just a fun vampire movie. It had shades of Salem's Lot and. It had some really great quirky comedy and dry humor that I really enjoy. I thought the vampire effects were really awesome here. And just seeing seeing Barbara Crampton as an evil and creepy vampire feeding on people, there's something just so satisfying about that. <laughs> there, there really is, man. I've loved Barbara Crampton for such a long time, man. And she just proves how awesome she is in a movie like this. And she was so awesome. She was beyond awesome. It was so cool, man. I mean, her and Larry Fessenden had great chemistry together. And it's just a fun movie, man. It's just a fun movie. And it's just a great little vampire indie film that I think deserves a hell of a lot of love, man. If you get a chance to watch this, please do. Because, man, you're 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 going to enjoy this one. You really are, man. It's It takes... A lot of different elements from a lot of vampire movies and just makes it into a fun and entertaining yarn. This is so cool, man. And with the slip in great condition. Oh, yeah. Mm. More Barbara Crampton in the collection? That is never a bad thing. That is for damn sure, guys. That is never a bad thing at all. Jacob's wife. Not bad, man. Now... I also, this week, ended up going over to Soundgarden again. I actually went to Soundgarden with uh, John and our friend Van. We ended up going and ch chilling out, looking for some some media, movie hunting. You know, you, you, you gotta go out with your bros and movie hunt every now and again. And we did. And I had store credit. I actually took more movies over to Soundgarden to get more store credit. And I got these for free. Didn't pay anything for them. So that was really cool. And the first one that I got is some Scream Factory Love. And that is none other than Brain Dead. Yes, with Bill Pullman and Bill Paxton, man. That's a great goddamn cover. <laughs> That's great. Oh, Lord. I remember this one from long ago. It's been a long time since I've watched it, however. It really has. So, I don't remember it 100%, but it was a really cool little uh, 
psychological like horror flick and it's all kinds of cool man oh i forgot that george kennedy was in this as well jesus that's awesome oh man that's cool and honestly when this thing came out uh, like a year a couple years ago from screen factory I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to pick it up or not. And I was sort of saying, yeah, maybe this might be a pass. And I just forgot about it. And then when I saw it at Soundgarden, I was like, wow, okay. I can get this thing for absolutely nothing. And it's got some really great actors in it. And I remember kind of liking it, so why not? I decided to pull the trigger, man. I gotta re re, -re watch this thing. Because I remember liking it. But, dude, with a cover like that, that it's instantly rewatchable. Come on, man. Ah, Bill Paxton and Bill Paul Pullman t together. Instant buy. Instant. Come on. Great, man. Pick that one up. I also got even more Scream Factory love and free Scream Factory love, obviously, from Soundgarden. And that is none other than Eyes of a Stranger. Yes. Sorry. Your party's dead. Yes! Look, great cover, man. Now, I have never seen this one b before. And I actually thought I had already owned it. Because I was looking at the cover, I'm like, man, did I pick this up already from Screen Factory? And I was thinking to myself, because they've been putting out a lot of, like, old school unknown slashers, or ones that, that really were sort of flied under the, the, the radar. And I thought I did, but I didn't. And I'm glad I pulled the trigger on this one, man. I mean, it's got some cool people in it. I mean, it's got Jennifer J Jason Lee in here. John DeSanti. I mean, it's got some really cool people. And directed by Ken Wiederhorn, who, of course, did Shockwaves. Which, by the way, I already own Shockwaves in, in the collection. That's an awesome, awesome movie, by the way. This is an interesting one. From the production company behind the original Friday the 13th. Not bad. I definitely am interested in checking this one out, man. It looks like an interesting sort of uh, killer slasher flick, which I'm interested in checking out, man. I mean, I'm always interested in new and interesting horror flicks. I, I really am, man. Ones that I've never heard of. Ones that have flown under the radar. I have a ton of them in the collection. And when I saw this one, I'm like, this this looks kind of cool. And I like that Screen Factory does this. I mean, yes, Screen Factory puts out big, well-known horror films, but I love that they also give the little indie ones a chance as well. Ones that maybe kind of got swallowed up in the times and maybe deserve a revisit. And this might deserve one. I'm definitely interested in checking this one out, man. And, of course, it was free with all of the the bonus points and everything that, that I had from Soundgarden. So, why the hell not get it? So, definitely am excited about this one, guys. That is awesome. Now, I also, through Orbit DVD, got a couple of titles in the mail as well. One of them, this one in particular, I'm super excited about, man. I haven't seen this movie in ages, but I used to love this shit back in the day on VHS, man. Watch the hell out of it. It was one of those ones that my mother and father taped on VHS, and I just watched it. And me being a wrestling fan, this one was right down my alley. And that is none other than Body Slam. Oh, God. God, Body Slam. I love Body Slam. This is so cool, man. I mean, you got Rowdy Roddy Piper, Captain Lou Albano, and a whole bunch of other personalities, man. This is great. I just love this idea of this guy getting this wrestling team together to, to take on this evil wrestling team. And obviously, like, things go crazy and wild and weird and hilarious shit ensues and i i just love it man I, I i really do man it was it was a great movie back in the day just because of how much i was a wrestling lover at that time and loving rowdy roddy piper and loving all of the wwf characters at that point and i'm like i'm like captain lou albano i'm like what and it's like you know you have to remember it was that time 
where movies like this was happening and obviously the Cindy Lauper videos and it was just a whole smorgasbord of stuff man the whole like entertainment that was in your face in wrestling at that time and body slam was just awesome I mean it's, it's an excuse to get some wrestlers to, together and make an entertaining movie but I enjoyed the hell out of it man and I am so happy that Kino Lorber released this, man. This is awesome. Did I ever think that Body Slam was going to get a great physical media release? No, but this is a major one on the wish list. And now, oh, definitely scratch it off, man. That is cool. Body Slam. Mm, God, I can't wait to revisit this sucker. I cannot, man. That is cool. I also ended up picking up through Orbit DVD, a new one, one that I have not watched, but it's got a really, really great horror actress in here that I love, man, and that is none other than 10 Minutes to Midnight. Yes, look at that. I I, I love that cover. <laughs> that was great. I love that cover, man. That is so cool. Caroline Williams. Caroline Williams. I mean, I would put her in the Scream Queen category. Yes, maybe not as prolific as Jamie Lee and not as prolific as, obviously, other actresses out there. But I still think she kind of deserves it just a little bit. I, I really do, man. And I was reading the synopsis and she returns to the DJ booth and... She gets bit by a bat and she's slowly becoming a vampire and she's like terrorizing uh, uh, people and it's, it, it seems cool. It looks cool. I love seeing Caroline Will Williams as, as the bad guy and ready to like chomp on people and, and suck their blood and shit. Like that's just cool, man. And I read a lot of reviews online. I watched YouTube stuff and a lot of people seem to be digging this movie. So... I want to give it a chance, man. I, I really do. The cover is killer, and I just like Caroline Williams, man. I mean, I'm a sucker for Texas Chainsaw, too. I mean, I love her in that movie. She's awesome, and she's just great in a lot of other flicks that I've really enjoyed over the years, and why not give it a go? So, 10 minutes of midnight. Uh, hey, I, I love vampire flicks, and there have been some good indie ones as of late. I mean, Jacob's Wife definitely proves it, so why not give a little love to another? 10 minutes to midnight. Not bad. And last, but certainly not least, is I'm starting to dive into the arrow sale that has been going on. And I'm slowly picking up stuff here and there. And the first thing that I got from the sale, and I'm so happy that I've, I got this. I've been wanting it for a while, mind you. And that is none other than Deadly Manor. Oh, look at that. That is cool. She has a lust for life. Pray it's not yours. Oh, look at that. That is cool, man. I love it. And I've been actually eyeing Deadly Manor for a while. I really have, man. And every time I've been wanting to get it, I haven't been pulling the trigger. And I'm like, ah, when am I going to do it? And I figured, why the hell not do it now, man? And also, it's directed by the same guy who directed Edge of the Axe which I already own and do love Ed Edge of the Axe. I'm like, okay, I gotta, give, I gotta give it a try, man. It seemed like a cool little horror slasher flick, maybe a little bit ridiculous and off-kilter, but then again, guys, I got some weird shit in the collection, man. So, uh, can you really blame me? I mean, come on, man. Though, so, I'm looking forward to this one. I really am. And I love Arrow putting out these sort of weird, unknown slasher movies, man, that, that they've done, like Edge of the Axe which I had never heard of until Arrow had r released it and a couple other ones that, that they've done. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because as a horror movie lover, I have I've experienced a lot of horror films, a lot of stuff out there. But let's be real, you're always searching for stuff w within the genre that you've never seen before that you need to experience. And... Once you get away from all the more popular stuff and the stuff that's, you know, the, the classics and the common stuff, you start to do a great deep dive into old school horror, 
into into these different subgenres and you start to find some really unique gems and maybe Deadly Manor is one of them. I'm definitely interested to dive into this, man. This looks pretty cool and very killer. Pun totally intended. <laughs> oh yes, baby. Oh my god, look at this physical media love, baby. Oh yeah, I think uh this week hmm I was definitely on my physical media game. And before I let you guys go, very interesting article that I found. And yet another one of those streaming wars. Yes, another one in the long line of streaming war battles. The streaming wars have begun. <laughs> yes, they have indeed, baby. And they will continue for a long time. And yet another one enters into the long line of streaming platforms. Redbox. Hey! Not one to stay away from capitalizing on new entertainment. Why not, Redbox? Hell, we've got everything else. Kind of makes sense. Really? Let's dive in, shall we? Redbox projects that it will double its revenue in the next two years, largely by converting many of its 40 million customers from disc rentals to streaming. Additionally, the company plans to grow revenue from streaming partnerships with Netflix and Hulu, as well as from a third-party kiosk maintenance business that services Amazon.com's locker-based pickup locations. Now... Redbox said its loyalty program has 39 million members. Whew, that's a lot of goddamn people. Whew. The program offers incentives for customers to keep coming back to Redbox's DVD rentals and digital services, which include video on demand and free ad-supported TV. While that tally is well below the 207 million global subscribers Netflix report at the end of the first quarter or the 100 million subscribers the Walt Disney Company's Disney Plus touted in March, it is in line with the 36 million global streaming subscribers Viacom recently reported and the 44.2 million HBO Network and HBO Max streaming customers Warner Media reported in the U.S. alone. Now, Redbox, with its affordable no-contract kiosk model, was one of the last innovators in the DVD trade as the burgeoning world of streaming video began swallowing video stores whole. Founded in 2002, Redbox, during the heydays, enjoyed a majority share of the disc rental market. In 2015, it reported revenue of $1.6 billion. That's with a B. But Redbox ultimately found itself on the wrong side of the video history as consumers moved away from physical media. The company reported $546 million in revenue for 2020, down 34% year over year, a decline that the company attributed in part to the much slower pace of new film releases during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, they go on to say some really interesting stuff here, man. It's, it's, it's kind of fascinating, honestly. While assembling a bundle among various subscription video services like Netflix and Hulu can exceed the cost of a paid TV subscription, many companies are now offering free streaming video platforms supported by advertising revenues. That includes Redbox. In 2020, it launched the advertising-based streaming platform Redbox Free Live TV. Such ad-supported platforms have been growing in the U.S., offering free streaming options for linear-like viewing. While Redbox is well behind other well-funded competitors like Pluto TV and Tubi, they do believe that the free offering will provide an easy entry point for many of Redbox's existing customers that have yet to try the ad-based streaming service. Redbox also has a transactional on-demand streaming platform it launched in 2017, which allows consumers to access new release films online, and it provides signups to other streaming apps like Netflix, Showtime, or Hulu, for which it gets a portion of the subscription fee. Uh, see where we're heading? Yes, absolutely. And Redbox is further betting on growth in its kiosk services business and Redbox Entertainment Studio. The company employs a team of maintenance professionals. Uh, well, maintenance professionals, more like Redbox bandits. But you guys know all about that in my previous videos. Oh, yes, they, uh, they do. It's 40,000 kiosks nationwide. 
Oh, yes, it, it has, man. Boy, I might got 40,000? Seriously? Jesus, man, that, that, that is crazy. And they've also branched into other areas as well. The company's production studio is also looking at slate deals. It, re it recently signed an agreement with Bas Basil Wanex Thunder Road Films, the studio behind the John Wick franchise, to make 10 to 12 action films over the next two years in the $10 million to $15 million budget range, on top of plenty of other endeavors that Redbox tends to do. Wow, baby. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't really know that Redbox was in the streaming world. I didn't really realize that, man. And now that I do, that is that is odd to me. Man, it's really weird. But honestly, I can't say that I blame Redbox for doing this because a lot of people have been cutting the cord. Okay, I cut the cord years ago, and I know a lot of other people have done the same. Hell, my mother is about to do it this year, and she has talked to me about, you know, I have all these cable channels, and I have all these things, and I pay such a huge amount for this stuff, and I almost have nothing to watch. And I told her, I said, look, you, you, you gotta cut the cord. You gotta go to... Roku or Fire Stick or something, you gotta do it because you can't just keep on paying these insane prices. However, you also have to understand that when you cut the cord, you want obviously the better cost and you don't want to fall into the same trap of paying that same crazy amount. And this is where the streaming wars are really going to have an effect because Let's say, for instance, on top of paying for the internet, which of course is a must with streaming, you also have to get all the equipment, and on top of that, you have to pick what stuff you're actually going to pay for. Now, once you start to add everything up, you have Netflix, and you have Disney+, Plus and you have Hulu. If you want Hulu plus live TV, that's even more money, or you could go down the the road of other live TV options. And there is a lot a lot of them like Sling. Sling is a, another one that's that that's out there. Tubi TV is another one that's incredibly popular, man. However, that's more free, but again, ad-based services, which is something that Redbox is going for because Redbox is banking on the fact that these consumers are willing to go towards the free ad-based ser service. So basically, Redbox is banking on you watching their platform. Yes, you get a lot of content for free, but because it's ad-based, they can still get the revenue from you watching what they're putting up. And of course, you have these companies that are going to pay for ads on their streaming ser service. They pay Redbox the the time to put the ads on, and then the companies get the benefit of those ads being in front of the consumers. It's the same concept as cable TV. These companies pay for the commercial airtime, and consumers see it, and they're hoping that the consumers will then buy their product, so it's all one huge, gigantic cycle. And so that's where a lot of these companies are heading. And they're banking on the fact that, look, do you really want to pay for all of this other extra stuff? Do you really need that? No, I mean, you deserve free. And it is free, however, just because it's free doesn't mean that Redbox isn't making money off it, because they still are. And, hey, that is proof positive of it, especially all the revenue that, that, that they're getting. I mean, look. This is interesting, especially from Redbox's point of view, because Redbox isn't exactly going out of its way to make new content. I mean, yes, they did sign up with with that production company to make like smaller action films that they can put exclusively on their Redbox streaming service, which I'm sure is going to be an advantage for 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 them, even if it's just a tiny one, it's still an advantage. But the fact that they they're partnering up with Hulu and they're partnering up with Netflix, and the fact that the fact that they can ape off of them, 
and yet you don't have to deal with crazy fees, and yet they can still get the revenue. I just like the fact that they're being a little bit more smarter about it than some of these other ones. I mean, yes, they still want content, 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 but but they're not going out of their way to actually compete with a Disney Plus or a Netflix or you know Peacock or Paramount Plus. They're they're not doing that. Why? Because they have no chance in hell of actually doing it, and they know that. What they do know is that they can take that content and and license some of that content to their own platform and yet, you know, get a little bit of portion of the fees from obviously people subscribing to Netflix through their platform and it's all it's all one huge conglomerate of of accessibility, I would say. And it's really fascinating to me, and it's really interesting when when you when you end up breaking it all down. It, it's almost like it's almost like um, like like uh, rats feeding off of the scraps of other people, right? I mean, I, I mean, seriously, if you really think about it, it, it is. But Redbox doesn't mind taking the scraps. Because they still make a shitload of, of money. Their their overhead is technically pre pretty low. And on top of that, you know, they give you the, the content. Technically, you love it because it's free. But yet, they're still making money off of the ads. And yet, getting re revenue off of some of these bigger platforms. I mean, it's kind of brilliant if you think about it. I mean... Nowadays, with everyone cutting the cord, it's all about free, free, I want good accessibility, I want to be able to enjoy content and not have to pay crazy amounts, and the red box is like, come to us, come, and and they, they built a really great subscriber platform doing the DVD and Blu-ray rentals. And now they're banking on the same thing with the subscription service. And I, do I 100% agree with it? No, because technically you don't need all of those extra little tidbits. You really don't at the end of the day. But it is enticing. And people are always looking for a bargain. And they're always looking for a deal. And Redbox knows this. That's how they built their business in the first place. You want to deal, you want to be able to to obviously know that you're getting a bargain on this media that you want to watch. That's why they have 40,000 fucking kiosks all over the goddamn place. That's why they make billions of dollars because they have a really good strategy and they've been able to to maybe not exactly be ahead of the curve, but been able to be smart about about taking the table scraps from the right places and this is a very interesting idea that that they're doing will it morph will it change yes it will because let's be honest the streaming wars are just really early i mean they're really just beginning there's a hell of a lot more that's coming down the pike in years to come and there will be services that are going to become the dinosaurs they will die Will Redbox become one of those? Who knows? I mean, they've been smart at this point. I can't say that I love their business model all of the time, and I can't say that that I've used their service a lot, but when I have, I do appreciate it. And again, I think they're taking advantage of a situation that wasn't that wasn't their doing. But if they're able to make the money off it, why not do it? I think it's fascinating. I mean, yet another company that's into the whole streaming service stuff. I mean, it's kind of crazy that we're here at this point. I mean, not like Redbox is getting rid of physical media, but just imagine if this was Blockbuster. Like, like that Blockbuster was doing this instead of Redbox. I mean, it's crazy because... With Blockbuster, Blockbuster had the chance to to buy Netflix 
and they never did it. And they had a chance to, to, to do these type of services with the kiosks and, and they weren't able to, to quite successfully do it. And other companies like Redbox took the concept and ran with it and was able to beat all these other companies to the punch. They saw the trends and they saw where things were moving and companies at the end of the day have to evolve and getting into the streaming game is quite risky, but if you're able to be smart about it, you can still make a profit and maybe just uh, maybe survive at the end of the day. We'll see where this all goes, guys, but it's incredibly very interesting and very fascinating to me. Definitely let me know what you think about all that, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, definitely give it the thumbs up, and for new to the channel, welcome. Check out the other Blu-ray and DVD out and about videos that I do every single week, the theatrical movie reviews with my friends, movie hunting like Dollar Tree hunts, Blu-ray pickup videos, live streams, and much, much more. If you are a lover of movies and physical media, hit subscribe and become a part of the Film Fan Nation. I want to thank my awesome subscribers out there. You guys are amazing and awesome, and you show me so much love. The great feedback and the comments and you guys continually watching and it's amazing and I can't thank you enough. So you give the love to me and I hope I really do give the love back to, to you guys. I really hope I do, man. So if you love what I do, definitely hit subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you are notified every single time that I make a video. Keep up to date with everything I'm doing through Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Film Fan went away. Keep up to date with everything I'm doing, plus special pictures and videos I do from time to time on social media as well. And if you guys want to send any subscriber love my way, posters, care packages, physical media, you name it, you can do it. The P.O. Box is in the description below. And Look, it's not expected, but it is appreciated, and you guys have told me constantly, you guys have said, hey, we're interested in sending you stuff, where do we send it? And I decided to give this P.O. Box a chance, and you guys, my God, you guys have not disappointed me. It has been absolutely amazing and awesome what I've gotten from you guys, and you guys continually amaze me and surprise me, and I can't wait to see where this journey takes me next with the P.O. Box. I can't wait. You guys have been amazing, and 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 I just can't wait for what love comes my way next. You guys are absolutely f phenomenal, and I and I really do appreciate it. Truly, I do. So, so thank you beyond words. Truly, truly, thank you. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Have a great, wonderful physical media week. Enjoy movies, and remember, happy hunting.